10 years ago prior to the deck box prior to the deck box all right uh, and so also like who are you oh sure welcome to the podcast you yeah. know like. uh so i'm josh uh pilot carter uh if you are from halifax you've probably seen me around uh i have been doing the deck box will be 10 years in august uh yeah we started on Quinpool, uh which is another part of town and we're on brunswick street now in a bigger spot uh but yeah we started here 10 years ago um we started very small uh and just kind of built it out we when we moved here our focus was on doing magic was kind of our big one because when we first looked at the market there were a number of other shops in halifax uh but most of them were catering to uh, a little more comic books a little more casual magic in terms of like you know they were doing sort of the traditional old school store model of like you know mm -hmm. we have a store we sell packs we've got a couple of cards here and there you know we've got like you know miniatures and comics and a mix of stuff um, but what we came in and wanted to focus on was having a really specific focus on having magic singles and availability. Because for me, I've, you know, yeah, I had sort of a, <laughs> a, a formative experience of when I was playing magic. Of when I went to a store, was, I saw a deck online and was super excited. And I just needed a couple of comms and uncommons to build on my deck for standard. Um, and the store that I went to basically said, you know, you know, I was like, hey, I just need these guys. They should be like, you know, my whole list of cards should be like maybe 10 bucks, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, you know, we don't do singles, but we have packs. So just crack packs to find it. Um, Great advice. <laughs> which is, you know, which is a very, you know, for context, you know, I've been playing for like 20 plus years. So like, you know, this is, this is a very old store that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but like, you know, it's, you know, that was the mentality of, you know, that you just say like, you open packs to get what you needed. You, maybe you traded with some other people, but you kind of worked with what you had. Mm -hmm. And when we did singles here, what we wanted to do was we wanted to have it. So if you walked in and were excited about something, if you were excited about, you know, a deck or a strategy that we could help you out with that, because with magic, it's interesting in that, you know, if you go into other product categories, if I have a, you know, a $20 item and a hundred dollar item and a $5 item, you know, some of those things are interchangeable. So if you just want to have like something to eat, you know, there's a list of options sure. you can pick from in magic. If you need this common, because it does a very specific thing, it doesn't matter if I have a $20 card or an infinite number of other 50 cent commons you could have, you know, you need it for this specific effect. And if I don't have it, your deck doesn't work the way you want it to. So being able to facilitate play and facilitate play in the way that people want to play their game relies on having the individual cards to make that happen so like you know we've got a really deeply stocked selection of singles i have obscure commons from like awful sets that no one will probably ever want but we have them in case someone does want them because we don't want to prejudge that someone might ever one day want this card you know do you, you know do you need a mountain goat in your life a one mana one one mountain walking goat from ice age no no you don't but you know, maybe the person who's like, I'm maybe building a goat deck, maybe I really need them travel goats. Goat, and it's like the key thing they want. <laughs> we want to have it for you in case you want it, you know, and that's part of that sort of customer service availability thing. And so when we opened in Halifax, the goal was to sort of, you know, have, you know, you know, have everything we could possibly have because it facilitated play, it facilitated people being engaged. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have, uh, you know, the thing I hate the most is when someone comes in looking for something and we don't have it. Um, because you know, I want to make sure that if they came to me looking for something, you know, that they left with what they were looking for. So like when we first opened in Halifax, there was four other stores at the time. Um, and when, you know, we were the new store. And so people would come to us after they hit everywhere else. And they'd come with their shopping list and go, okay, cool. You know, they'd have like 30 cards on a list and go, and it was clear they had like one or two that didn't cross out. And it was very clear that they'd been to like the other stores beforehand. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, cool. I have this list of stuff, you know, I'll take what you have on it. You know, like just whatever you got for it, you know, just fill what you can. Yeah. And we go, well, we have all that. And they go, oh, I wasn't planning to buy all of that today because I didn't expect you to be able to fulfill it all. So I actually need to cut some of my wants list because, you know, I, you know, I was planning to spend 20 bucks on the stuff that you had, but you had the whole list, which was a hundred bucks. I got to figure that out now. Yeah. Um, and then one of the things we've noticed over the last couple of years is that, you know, we get fewer of those sort of interactions where it's more like, okay, cool. I know you have all of it. And if you're missing like one or two, that's the expectation. Like, you know, like, no, okay. Yeah. You had, you know, you know, this commander list, hundred cards from scratch, you know, you had like 97 of them and the three you didn't have, I'm not surprised because it like spiked up like, you know, last night, you know, mm -hmm. you know so stuff like that.
Um, so yeah, so for us, it's always been about building, you know, that availability and building, using that to help build community, because if someone comes and engages in the way they want to engage, they're more likely to want to come back and want to be, you know, included. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And community building is like a massive component. Obviously, like it's baked into everything that happens here. Yeah. All right. I can tell from the conversation that we've been having yeah. <laughs> prior to hitting the record button, yeah. uh, going even further back. Sure. Why, why do this at all? Why get into the game business oh, when just... not just, you know, continue playing as a magic player? So for this, for me, uh, I got into this. Uh, so I, we've had the deck box for about 10 years. Um, and the deck box was actually an expansion of a store that I had in Summerside. Um, and I started that store uh, after I had moved to Summerside and PI uh, for work. Uh, and the, the contract position I was on, it ended, uh, and there was a opportunity to sort of start our own space. And we'd had sort of like the local bookstore kind of reach out to us and say, well, we had some magic inventory and stuff, you know, we were thinking about getting out of it. Do you want to like, you know, take it over? And, you know, my partner and I, Rachel talked about it and, you know, we decided that it was something that, you know, there was never another time to sort of try it. You know, we were both fresh out of university. We've been out of university for about a year. You know, we had student debt, you know, we didn't have anything else on the go. And we felt you know, like this was something that I felt that we could be good at. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, she really encouraged me to, you know, take the plunge on it and basically say, you know, if this is something you're interested in, you know, I believe in you and I want you to pursue it, you know, and we made the choice to sort of do that. And we did, uh, Game On was our first store. Uh, we did that for five years. And in year three and a half, four, I think, uh, we opened the deck box, which is a sort of our second location, because uh, we had sort of been doing a lot of good community building work in Summerside, and that had gone really well. And we sort of figured out kind of our model of what we wanted to do. Um, and you know, we had gone to Halcon, which is like the local sci-fi convention mm -hmm. uh, in our second year, I think. Um, and on a recommendation of one of our clients and we'd gone there, you know, not knowing quite what to expect. So we kind of just brought all of our stores inventory at the time, you know, sort of to see what worked. Um, and there's a huge demand for individual cards. So we showed up, we did in Halcon on a weekend, what we had done in a whole month in Summerside, um, and sort of said, well, you know, there's, and the, the thing we kept getting from me was like, well, will you ship us stuff? You know, like, no. Um, and I'm really, I really don't like the online side of it. We'll get into that later. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we realized there was a lot of demand and we realized that the real difference between running a game store in Summerside and running a game store in Halifax was the scope of the market and the size of the competition. Mm -hmm. And we looked at it and said, well, you know, we think there's room from what we've seen at Halcon, what, we, you know, cause, you know, what we've seen at events is that, you know, I think there's room for a store that says, you know, singles and cards are important to building community and play experiences and you know and to building on that so we opened up our second location which is the deck box in uh was in oh gosh 2014 um and that was sort of you know our first expansion uh when we was up for context you asked how i started and i didn't quite answer um <laughs> you know we started when we started our summerside store uh with two thousand dollars from my last job um and just kind of built it into now uh, we've never taken on loans outside debt we have no partners it's just me and my wife rachel uh and it's you know you know one of the benefits of starting it very lean for us was that you know we were able to really you know we were able to really understand where where our money was being spent on and what was selling and what wasn't because it was something where we couldn't justify sort of doing big swing spends on inventory items that just didn't move you know it was like cool I'm bringing in this product, every product I know, because every product I need to sell, you know, I need to know what client's going to buy it, you know, what's going to be, you know, that really granular knowledge that only kind of comes from when you're going, this is what you have to play with. And then once it's gone, there's nothing else. Yeah. You know? um, and it's kind of where we've been built out to today. So, you know, we're now in a much bigger space in a much bigger market, but it's all kind of, you know, the same sort of plan of, you know, like, know what you're selling, know how to build community, know how to add value for your clients. And so you're making, you know, you know, making a, you know, a good community and experience for them to kind of just be around, you know, and the rest kind of handles itself. I'm sure a lot of people are probably listening to that and be like, wow, okay, $2,000, right? That's yeah, what you started I, I, with. I, I know it's, it sounds like a bullshit number. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we started with that. And when we relocated out here, I think we had, when we did the expansion here uh, for our first location, um, 
as some of our as some of our clients will know because they helped uh you know we laid our own floor uh we built our own tables at, you know for the for the first go at it uh one of the tables we built was very tall because <laughs> we didn't measure properly so <laughs> uh we had that one at the window for a while because i couldn't afford to replace it so because we had to pay for the wood and we were gonna use it, <laughs> gonna use it yeah. um but yeah so a lot of it is you know we we sourced all of our cabinetry from like you know closeout sales like it was it was very much hand built and hand uh, we figured out uh the biggest benefit that we did was that there was a store in summerside uh that we picked up our case case that you see next door mm -hmm. um that are that had was like a 80 year old jewelry store that had gone out of business so these are like solid wood cases but they're jewelry cases which if any sort of retailers out there i would really recommend these if you can find them um because traditionally what i will see is people who have um, the glass cases where it's just like a glass shelf and a glass shelf and yeah. cards on the shelf. Um, that looks like it's displaying a lot of cards, but the challenge with that is that it kills so much storage of what you could possibly use. So like if you're looking at it, most of the top level of what you're seeing on the display case is all someone sees. Sometimes people yeah. will squat down to sort of like look at some more cards a little down further. But if they're on your bottom shelf, no one's really seeing that. Um, it's whereas, kind of like merchandising at the eye line. Yeah, like, that's the stuff that moves. That's the stuff that the stuff on the bottom shelf is not going very fast. And if it's going to be, if it's going to not move for you, like you know, with our cabinetry, we have all that stuff below up just becomes storage space. So mm. for that cabinet setup that we have in store, um, you'll see sort of like you know, you can fit. I think it's a hundred and twenty cards in sort of like the layout and the top loader the way we have it. Um, but you know, we can store. There's eight drawers in a in a display, and each drawer holds around five thousand cards or more. Um, so like you're talking about 40,000 cards worth of storage in just one display cabinet, mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, hundred ish, 200 ish cards on like some of the like, glass shelves that yeah. may or may not move. You know, it, it just gives you more room to sort of, you know, do for other stuff. Kind of maximize your floor space, right? Yes, very much. I'm good at that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, 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 uh, the benefits of having rented, you know, spaces where I was like, cool, I can afford this much square footage and no more. And like, I need to have all this stuff and where's it going to fit? One Make of the, use of every inch. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one that we've got some old photos of our old store and, you know, when we moved to the new location, one of the best benefits was, um, we had not carried a whole lot of peripheral stuff, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because I did have, I have very little slap wall and the only place I could kind of put it in our old location was sort of like between where the, so we had sort of a, a long and narrow space. And so sort of like the counter where we had sort of our, your cards were here and the slap wall was on this side and people had to walk through it. So like, you know, I couldn't yeah. put too much or too many hooks because like people just knock them as they go by yeah. and stab themselves. So like, you know, when we moved to this location, we able to just kind of carry a lot of stuff on the wall. It was a very big deal for us because before it was, I had, you know, this much space, kind of a ring of counters, a little bit of slap wall, and then just like a little tiny, like Ikea size bookshelf of like, you know, D&D books that I could stock or like yeah. boxes. So it meant that like when we had product in, it was, you know, majority of it was had to be behind the counter just because like I had nowhere else to put it and I could just stack it up. No, I'm, I'm curious about the early days too. Like, sure. I think exploring that is is really interesting because so many store owners have had wildly divergent experiences, right? And, yes. and right now the general advice is, uh, you know, don't open a store unless you've got $200,000 or whatever that you want to throw at it and make sure you've got it fully capitalized and you had everything taken care of. And I would say that that's probably pretty close to true. And it's, good, say, it's good advice, yeah, right? It's yeah, not it's, bad. It's, it's not a bad advice. I would say that, you know, um, you, know, you know, there's a, I think it's Gary Ray, the, the middle class, like income on the local store. game store. Yeah. Uh, to a middle class lo income. Love his book. It's great. Yeah. Um, I, and I, and I read it a couple of times and I, you know, and for, in my defense, I read it after I started my own store, <laughs> which was probably not the right order. Um, but he has a section <laughs> where in the beginning where he talks about, you know, um, you know, that, you know, that there are like, you know, guys with, you know, a, a folding table and a dream, you know, and, you know, that they have really great stories, but to not follow their advice. And, and I'm that guy, like, you know, like you know, <laughs> the, 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 the advice part of it is, you know, I will say that, you know, for me, it's a big believer in building community and building your clientele along with it and understanding what it is your client wants and how to give it to them in a way that best works for both of you. Mm. Um, whereas the... You know, so, you know, my tale and mine and Rachel's tale is not a, it is not a thing I would recommend to most people because when we started, part of why we started it was that we had been, you know, you know, I had my contract had finished. I was looking for other work. And when I looked at taking, you know, I looked for a bit, hadn't found anything that really kind of worked because PI yeah, could be a tough place to find a job. Sure. Shock. Especially 10 <laughs> yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. 
And when I was looking around, you know, this came up. And one of the things we found is that we had, you know, I'd done the usual thing of apply for EI, which if you're not from Canada is basically mm -hmm. employment insurance. It helps you find another job or gives you money until you find another job. Um, and there, I was told there was, when we got approached for, you know, building a store, uh, I was told that there was a EI version of EI that you could take while you were a small business to promote it to basically to, you know, build your business and still take EI while you were doing it. So they would pay for you to take EI and extended EI while you're doing your business plan, while you're doing your first kind of like setup and prep. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we heard that and we thought, okay, well, you know, this makes sense to me, you know, this is, you know, you know, like I, you know, if I was going to take, if I could draw up to like, you know, my EI anyway, and then they would just top me up to sort of, you know, a little more great. Um, so we did that, put all the plans in motion to get started, open, started, things were going well. Um, and then 30 days, 60 days after we had opened, uh, you know, they called us and said, Hey, so we messed up and you don't in fact qualify for this. Hmm. Um, nice. Yeah. When you, that you, in addition to that, you don't qualify. The EI that you've generated because you were working as a self-employed person on your own project, you were, yeah, we want, yeah, that, we back. want that back. Now. <laughs> um, so for us, you know, we had started with two thousand dollars, and we had started with sort of a plan that I'd be able to draw most of my income that I'd been making at my previous sort of corporate job, um, and that didn't happen. So it made it so that you know we couldn't, you know, we could probably have walked away and just you know, mm -hmm. but you know, we decided that we couldn't make it work, and it just meant that we had to be profitable from day one. Um, so it's something where it's a very rare thing in our field, but, you know, we haven't had a year where we haven't at least broken even, you know, for it, if not, you know, you know, plus a little bit. Um, and that's gotten trickier for years because our expenses have gone up, but, you know, sure. it's always sort of been able to like pay for me and Rachel to kind of have, you know, a life together and, you know, be able to like, you know, you know be, be pretty comfortable. Uh, but no, it's, it's been, it's been a, a lot of stress and pressure at the beginning and it's kind of worked down the end, but yeah, I would not recommend my route for it. Yeah. Um, but I would say it's something where, you know, I would say that definitely being capitalized helps a lot. If you're, I don't know if I could see a, a path to getting where we are now from the get go that didn't involve 10 plus years of sort of, you know, you know, just grinding to figure it out, you know, whereas, you know, I don't know if I had come in even with, you know, a hundred thousand dollars today to start the business that we have now, you know, if that would be anywhere near enough to build out what I want to, where I'd want to be. Cause I think part of that process is, you know, to getting to the level of sort of some of the established stores that you'll see is, you know, building relationships. So we have clients that come in every week, you know, or we have clients that come in every couple of years, you know, it is not an uncommon thing for us to have someone who comes in and says, Hey, I haven't been since you were on your Quinpool location, like four years ago, I just got back into town. I was out, you know, somewhere else. I was yeah. doing something else or I had kids, you know, like, you know, yeah. they take a lot of time, go figure. Um, we were just like, you know, and, but like, it's something where like, if you don't have the years of build up to build that relationship, that's a client that, you know, once you sort of establish a good you know, relationship and they, and they like you and they want to support you, you know, they'll come back. It's part of why being customer service focused and sort of doing, a, you know, curating your community is such a big part of this is that, you know, when you, this is switching to a little more of a corporate business side of it, but you know, when they yeah, talk that, about that, in basic, that's support you know, when they talk about in basic business school, they talk about your customer lifetime value, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, if you are someone who drinks Coke and they can get you to be just a Coke guy, you know, starting in your teens, you know, all the way till you're, till you're not, you know, yeah, the 90 to, <laughs> of chugging a Coke. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, probably <laughs> at that point, you just keep chugging this. Like, What's it going to do? Yeah. Um, you know, at that, you know, the value of you as a client, you know, that individual Coke purchase may not be a huge number, but that purchase over time has a huge value attached to it. And you're talking about in the gaming space of, you know, you know, if I have a client, you know, and they spend a hundred bucks a month with me, which would be, you know, not unusual, not a super big spender, but not a small one either, you know, that's but it's their leisure money, they're, their leisure they're money, like you know, the money what, that they would go to the theater and go out to eat. Yeah. Like some of that comes to you. Yeah. If you break that out, you know, you assume it's like a thousand dollars, you know, on the run of a year, you know, not accounting for birthdays and Christmases and bonuses where people yeah. kind of go a little heavier. Um, you know, that's a lot of value that one client represents for you. And if you're saying, okay, well, I need to make a hundred thousand dollars in the run of a year in terms of revenue to make, you know, my expenses make sense, or maybe I need more, you know, that one client, you know, is a thousand bucks. If I keep them happy over the run of a year, I need a hundred of those guys to make a, a store kind of sustain itself, you know, on a, a bare minimum level. So like, you know, when you think about that in aggregate, that's not a huge number, like, you know, but what, mm -hmm. but every time you can sort of 
keep that person in the ecosystem, keep them happy, keep them feeling engaged in what they're doing, you know, making sure that they're, you know, just like you said to movie, you know, they came, they had a good time, they went home happy, great, they're going to come back the next one. Yep. You make a shitty movie, they didn't have a great time, they may come back, you know, or they may come back with reservations and you need to sort of, you know, make them realize that that last movie was shitty, but like this movie is better. And I, I misunderstood yeah. your taste and I'd like to, you know, I'd like to prove to you that, you know, I get you better now and this is what you want. Or maybe I give you something that you're not quite expecting, but is a beneficial thing, you know, but it's something like yeah. the, the value of a client and building that community is something that only comes with time. You know, it's, it's someone yeah. showing up every week, every couple of months and that they get the same experience they go every time, you know, it's part of, you know, why, you know, I don't think you could get to a store at this level without that sort of build out time for it. Cause you need time to build relationships. You need to, time to build, you know, people up to sort of say, okay, well, you know, I had a really good experience. And every time I go here, I'll come back. And if people like you, they'll tell somebody else about you. We are, you know, I am notoriously bad at spending on marketing. Um, you know, I, <laughs> you know, the, the line item, the percentage that I'm supposed to spend on that in most years, I just have not. <laughs> um, it just usually goes to other stuff, but it's something where a big part of, you know, what we're doing now and sort of our 10th year is focusing on, you know, being a little more verbal about, you know, cool, we're a really neat place. And if you're within our ecosystem, you 100% know us. And if you're a little outside of that, you may never have heard of us because we are a destination location. People are coming here because mm -hmm. they want a thing and we have it. And that's, you know, sort of the draw. So now we're doing kind of more outreach stuff like this where we just kind of want to like talk about what we do a little more. Yeah. No, I, I love the fact that you refer to them as clients. You yeah. said that like multiple times, yeah. whereas most, most retail stores consider them customers, right? Which is a little more transactional. I, find, I like the idea of client because that is more of a long-term relationship with somebody. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, it's something where, you know, I, even the, it's like the term client is a tough one for me because it's the closest option that I have when I talk about it that doesn't come across as overly familiar. Like, you know, I know some store owners who would consider their clients as friends and I have a lot of clients that I really, really like, but you know, I, you know, it's something where, you know, a friend to me is a really personal interaction. A friend is someone you call when you knew and you got in an accident and you need someone to come pick you up. Yeah. I'm not that person. I, you know, I would love to be, but you know, I'm not. Um, and I'd say with like the client side of it, in my mind, treating it like it's a customer is the equivalent of sort of saying, well, you know, to me, you're just an interaction to me. You're just, you know, profit going back and forth. And yeah. I don't see it that way. You know, for me, a client is someone that I've got a relationship with that we've built over time, you know, that, you know, you know, that there's an element of trust there. There's an element of reciprocity. A customer is someone that they say, Hey, you know, can you spot me five bucks? You probably go, mm, no, but a client will say, yeah, man, you're a little short. I'll cover you. That's not a big deal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're off by like, you know, a couple bucks on this trade in. Don't worry. About it. It's fine. You know, yeah. um, because that's an element of reciprocity, right? You know, you build that relationship, you build an experience and it's something where it's genuine, you know, it's something that, you know, um, <laughs> you know, if you, if I'm, I'm not a huge fan of you, you'll definitely be a customer, <laughs> but almost everyone's a client because we don't have a lot. We don't have a lot of customers. We have a ton of clients though. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, that's good. I think, uh, one of the other, other store owners in, uh, back in Kitchener actually, yeah. uh, named Tommy Gofton. He was, a a guy who owns a place called the round table and he's got all kinds of crazy stuff, but he was on, uh, the summit that I did years ago. And the way that he always referred to his relationship with his clients, clients, customers, yeah. whatever, he's called them patrons. Yeah. And I like that way of thinking about it. It was like this idea of having this relationship with people in your store. I do like and it's, that one. Yeah. It's a game store specific. It fits the theme, right? Oh, yeah. No, it definitely has those medieval vibes that you want to go for. And if he's going to go all himself the round table, I, I oh, guess. Yeah. <laughs> he's definitely got the medieval stuff going on. Uh, he's uh, another store with like an awesome aesthetic, like fantastic. He was a... <laughs> I believe he was a set designer or he had like experience oh, awesome. with the movie, uh, movie industry. So the place was done up in a way that's like hard to replicate. So he had a really interesting, specific, unique to him awesome. way of doing things. But the, the whole patron uh, concept of like thinking about your customers, thinking about the people who interact with your business and your store, I think that's the right way to think about it. I think it's a really good way to think about it because oh yeah, because it's not it, it's, this isn't just a retail store. No, and it's something where, you know, if, if, if you know, if you are, if you are retail focused and if you are retail fixated, there's, you know, even if you don't like the idea of, you know, customers are having relationships with you, you know, the reality of it is if you are strictly dollars and cents motivated, you want someone to have a relationship with you. 
because if you're setting up your system in such a way that you know someone likes you and wants to come back you are in a better position you know to if you treat them well you know and you know and to understand their needs and be you know attentive mm. you know, you're going to be in a better position to be more profitable longer on right like you know because the kind of clients that you attract with that sort of behavior is not the kind of guy who's shopping the lowest possible value you know like you know yeah. if, if so the guy who wants you just because you are the cheapest you know that's a customer you know and that's yeah. a customer you need to decide if you want to cater to or not or if it's something where that you think that the element of trying to keep up with that is not worth what you're getting out of it but if you are generating clients if you're generating people that you know you have a relationship with you know there's a give and a take there's you know a back and forth to it you know that's something where those people will provide you more value long term because they're not shopping you all the time for the lowest deal like the guy who's coming in yeah. and being a customer he just wants your you know your cards because they're like 10 percent under what market value for them should be and yeah. wants to buy all of them and then just like you know but he's not buying the other stuff from you he's target shopping you because you know that's you know his best value and if that's the kind of customer he is that's okay you know like you know, it's something where it's on you as a retailer to decide if that's something you want to cater to if that's something you want to you know not deal with if you want to deter it in some way but you know that kind of experience is something where you're very much it's on you as a retailer to see how you want to handle it so we are a large store you know we have a lot of traffic through we get about 170 transactions a day in store um so you know we we are busy um, there's always going to be some number of people who are looking to do, you know, thing, you know, like to come in and shop with us here, you know, shopping for different reasons, you know, and it's the kind of thing where if someone is shopping for the lowest dollar value possible, I generally take that as a approach saying, okay, that's fine. Like, you know, it's something where if someone comes in and says, I want these cards, you know, we have them in our system, we honor our stickered price for it. So if I have it in and it says it's 40 bucks, it's 40 bucks, you know, mm -hmm. you know, conversely, we also work in favor of the client of, you know, if something's mispriced in our system, you know, and I'm around, you can say, hey, man, you know, you have this at 40, you know, I'm seeing metrics online that tell me it's like 30. It was this an intentional pricing choice because I think it's yeah. worth 40, you know, and it's worth 40 in my local market. Or is it a you just didn't miss a decrease and will honor the decreased price, you know, like and that's something where that's a that's a relationship that you have with clients. And not a relationship that I would have with customers. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's 40 bucks for you, man. <laughs> yeah, it's 40 bucks for you. You know, it, it's, it's one of those ones where it's a, you know, there is a, you know, it's it's the difference between a client and a customer, right? You know, a mm -hmm. customer is someone that you're looking at, how do I get maximal profit out of it? And a client is someone that you have a relationship with. It's someone that you have a, a back and forth and an understanding that, you know, it is a more than a transactional relationship. You know, you give me money for stuff, you know, I provide a service in, res you know, in response, you know, and that service is anywhere from just, having the thing that you want reliably and efficiently. So, you know, you can walk in and walk out with your purchases if you want mm -hmm. in under five minutes. So if you come to me with a list and go, I want this stuff. Awesome. Neat. Check all the boxes. You look, looks good to you. You're in and out the door. Uh, our holiday time is really great for this. Cause we get a lot of sort of like the friends and family who come in with the list going, I need these seven things. I have no, I have no idea, idea what this are. is. Yeah. Can you tell me what I need? And it's like, yep, this is what you need. This is what it'll cost. It's like, awesome. You know, in and out. Um, it's one of those things where, that sort of it, you know, I really like the person to person interaction and the back and forth. And mm -hmm. so like that time of year is a little rough for me because I'm like, oh man, I just, I want to talk to you about the cool things you're buying. You're like, you know, let me, let me tell you why, like, you know, the new warning <laughs> is models are super cool. Like, you know, like just, you know, like, you know, you're getting some really awesome stuff. Like, do you, do you want to like tell me what you could do with it? Like, um, but that's something where, you know, that's a client experience and that's a, some people will find a value to that of being able to come in and talk about the thing they're excited about. Like mm -hmm. no one, no one comes into our store you know, not excited about something, whether they're excited to be there, excited for the thing they're going to get, excited with what they're going to do with the thing they're going to get, or you're just excited to kind of look, look at stuff and window shop of things that they might like to get in the future. You know, it's something where, you know, being responsive to that excitement in an authentic way is really important because, you know, mm -hmm. so many people have had people tell them that their hobbies are silly or why are you excited about yeah. this? And to have someone who goes like, Hey man, I see you're buying a box of space wolves. Like, you know, I played against the wolf and stuff. They're really cool. Like, have you heard of the strat that goes with them? And I was like, Oh no, I didn't know I could spend the CP to like, you know, give them like sixes do dev wounds. Like, you know, it's like, that's cool. Right. And that's a, that's something where it's an authentic, you know, experience on our end is part of why we hire our staff the way we do. Um, and it's something where the, the value add for that client is that they get to be seen as like this thing that I'm doing is cool, you know? It may not be cooler in the grand scheme of like, you know, is anyone going to write, you know, articles about how I'm awesome because I play Spillage Wolves? No, no one's going to do that. Yep. But like, you know, someone saw you and said, hey, that's cool. Like, you know, 
have you thought about this other cool thing that you can do with it? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, did you, you know, like, how are you going to use this? Like, you know, the stuff that it actually engages. And the only way that you get that kind of connection is if you're authentically interested in what someone is doing because you're part of the community and part of the experience, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you know, if I haven't played a whole bunch of games of Warhammer, I wouldn't know what that unit does. I just know it's a box of plastic space marines and they look like all the other boxes of plastic space marines, except this one is different and why he wants this one versus the other box next to it. And knowing the difference is a big part of the value that you add to your clients where it's something you yeah. know. One of the things I like about my job a lot is I pull a lot of magic card lists and I played for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I have played for a very long time, I know what these cards do. So when someone pulls a list and goes, cool, I'd like a winter orb. I'd like a stasis. I'd like this, and this, and this. I'm like, okay, right. cool. You're so, out to ruin everyone's yeah, fun. Yeah, so just, just as a, like a heads up, just so we're clear here, you you want to have no friends. Like, just like it's, it's like when someone shows up and like buys something. Like, hey, just so you know, this is what this is typically used for. Are you cool with that? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I want to be an asshole. Like, you know, yeah. it's like I want I want to have zero friends by the end of this game. It's like, okay, that's cool. I just wanted to check, right? <laughs> like, you know, it was like, you know, it's it's something where like that level of you know, feedback and you know acknowledgement, of, like, cool. You know, it's like it's like walking to the store and going, cool. I would like a can of gasoline and some rags. It's like <laughs> neat. Yeah, you know, like you know, that's gonna what that's gonna be used for, right? Like, yeah, fully I'm, aware. Fully, fully aware. <laughs> I, I, I'm good. It's like, all right, cool. Just. Just doing my due diligence and asking you. Yeah. It's like, um, so you know, I want to burn down my play group. Um, but yeah, but stuff. being able to nerd out with somebody okay. and connect with them on something that, like, it's a, the, a hobby, right? It's this shared passion that defines us as nerds for oh, yeah. the most part. That's yeah. a big value for people coming to the store. Oh yeah, it's part of why people want to come back, right? That they feel that they were. It's like running a. It's running a. You're when you're running a gaming store, you are in a weird position of you are running a retail operation which pays for your community experience, you know, and if you can't balance both those things, if you focus, if you can't kind of make both of them work, you're going to run into trouble because, you know, you can have the best game and community experience in the world, but if you can't get the numbers to work to fund that, you know, it doesn't matter because that community will inevitably evaporate when you go under, right? Like if you can't pay your bills, if you can't do the things you need to do, yeah. you know, you will not be around for your community long term. Um, and conversely, if you're nothing but a retailer where it's all customers and no clients, you know, it's something where you're going to run a sort of like hollow experience where it's like, cool, yeah. you know, I may as well go to Walmart, you know, I may as well go buy my, if I, well, if Walmart had singles, I would go shop there yeah. you know, because like, you know, it's that kind of, you know, retail experience, um, and finding the balance between sort of making it all work and also building that sort of really active and, you know, passionate community is a challenge, but it's definitely something that if you're you know, you're skilled at it, can definitely do really well. It's something where the community part of it is a big element of, you know, what, what makes it all tick and having that authentic interest is a big part of that. You know, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I am not a D and D player. That is, that is Rachel's thing. Um, but I, you know, when a new D and D source book comes out, um, I read it. Why? Because, you know, I want to be able to talk to someone if they're interested about it, about the new hot thing. You know, like, I don't need any pushing to go be excited about Warhammer or Magic or Pokemon or Lurkana. Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, for things that are outside of my purview. So, like, I am I am not much of a player of video games, even though we carry a lot of them. Um, because it's something where, given all the other things that I'm interested in, like, video games are one that's hard to prioritize. Um, but it's something where, you know, we hire people who are super excited about video games. You know, we've got a couple of guys who can go... Oh, cool. You really like Dishonored? Let me tell you about the other games that if you like Dishonored are similar to Dishonored. It's like the same yeah. sort of concept in you know, bookstores where you're hand selling, right? Like, you know, I'm telling you something because I think it's cool and interesting. And that's my authentic opinion, not because the manufacturer told me that I need to sell X number of copies. It's a yeah. need. I will tell you what I thought about this experience, you know, like good and bad, with the idea that being that, you know, eventually, you know, that you'll trust my recommendation when I say, hey, you like the last thing that I recommended for you. Here's something that's to your taste profile is, you know, kind of what I would recommend. So it's typically why when we have video game clients come in, they'll go, well, you know, I'm looking for video games. It's like, all right, man, like, what's the last thing you played that you liked? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, give me some insight into, you know, oh, you played Minecraft. All right, cool. Like, you know, did you like the building elements? Was it like yeah. the survival mechanics? Like, you know, let's dig a little into, and it's really helped people sort of, you know, it's been neat to sort of see that people have gone, oh, <coughs> I never really thought about, you know, what it is I like about these things, just mm -hmm. that I, you know, I enjoyed the last thing I played, you know, but what was it about it that worked? Because, you know, it's something where if you have that in-depth knowledge of, you know, you know, games and sort of how they're structured, you can say, okay, well, you know, 
I know if you liked this element for this reason, here's something else that is may look different, but its core elements are similar. You know, it may look like it's not yeah. the same type of game, but like if you play it, you'll go, oh, I really like this. So, for example, there's a video game that came out that I really liked, uh, Mortals of Avram. Um, and it's a single player shooter style experience. Um, and part of what I liked about it and part of what it got middling reviews for was that it was a very short play experience where it's a, mm -hmm. it's like a 10 to a 12 hour game, maybe 20 hours if you kind of like do everything in it. Um, but it's like a linear storytelling experience about sort of like a, a high fantasy world where you like you shoot magic as if it was a weapon. Like it's, okay. it's very fun, um, but it's short and it's to the point, has a cool sort of story wrapped up in it, but it's definitely something where, you know, it's not an Elden Ring where you can spend like hundreds of yeah. hours and right. like, you know, just, you know, grinding into it. But for someone who's like me, where, you know, you know, I'm in my late thirties and, you know, it's something where I'm, you know, I only have about like 15 to 20 hours in a weekend if I like really sit down and just like play it straight. So I need mm -hmm. something that I can like play in a couple of sittings or I can play in sort of like, you know, one sitting if I have like a weekend for it, you mm -hmm. know, and just be done it and not feel like I'm, oh man, like I got like halfway through and didn't finish. You know, it's something where, you know, that's the kind of thing where, you know, to me, the value is not in that it was hundreds of hours of gameplay. I don't need that. I've got stuff to do. You know, yeah. <laughs> the value to me is that I can like play it in a discrete session and just feel like I got something accomplished and got a full experience. And whether mm -hmm. it was like, you know, the fact it was an $80 game for 12 hours of playtime versus an $80 game for hundreds of hours of playtime, it's irrelevant to me because I'm not going to play the hundreds of hours for it. But that's yeah. something where, you know, that kind of a recommendation, if someone comes in and says, well, you know, I bought like Assassin's Creed, you know, Odyssey, and mm -hmm. I like, you know, I like got into all these things and Far Cry and like, I just, you know, like, you know, I never finished any of them. Like, hey man, if you like this sort of stuff, you know, and what you're telling me is that you like playing games, but you do not have, you know, you know, the ability to play like, you know, 40 plus hours a week playing video games. Here's something I'd recommend, you know, here's something like mm -hmm. The Quarry or here's something like, you know, Immortals where it's like, these are discrete play experiences that you can play them replay them if you enjoyed them but they're sort of like you know a manageable chunk versus like your elden rings and your fire cries where they're like yeah requiring a good chunk of your life to kind of get through <laughs> but that's kind of like coming back to it is you know you know that's how you add value for clients like knowing mm -hmm. what they're looking for and being attentive to it rather than just treating them as a customer where it's like cool if i sell you this thing this thing has a higher margin than this other thing and i want you to buy that it's like no i want you to buy what you know i want you to buy what works for you and if nothing i have works for you don't buy anything like if it's, if nothing grabs you that's okay. You know, it's, you know, you know, it's something where your recommendations need to be based on actually listening to your clients rather than what is best for you. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, being the guide, right. Yeah. Being the trusted advisor who can point the person to the best experience possible, whatever oh, yeah. that happens to be. Oh yeah. And it's part of it. There's a, there's a practice and a form to it of trying to figure out, you know, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Like let's, let's ask the, let's interview someone. Let's ask the questions that get me to, the details I need to know about them. So, so someone comes and says, well, you know, I'm just getting into magic, you know, my buddies play, you know, mm -hmm. they told me it'd be super fun and it looks kind of cool. What do I need? I'll say, okay, well, like, have you played other card games before? Have you played like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh? Okay. Haven't played those starting brand new. Um, do you know what your buddies are playing? Well, I think they're playing like a hundred card format. They have like really big decks. Like, okay. So they're probably playing commander. Like, so what I'd recommend is I would recommend if you, you know, I would say, so there's, magic has a free version of magic called magic arena you know i would recommend starting with that because there's a really good job of like tutorializing you how to play you can play it on your phone i'd recommend desktop because playing on your phone is a little tricky but with you know i would say like try that if you like that it you know even if you like it play it through a bit you know it'll kind of walk you through all the basics kind of like a video game also like step up your difficulty introduce you to new mechanics in a timely mm -hmm. way because when you first get into magic playing it it can be a lot, you know, there's a, you know, you're basically talking about a game where we have agreed upon the rules we've made up in our heads that agree with the rules that you know, someone else wrote. Yep. Um, and that that is something where that's a lot if you're not familiar with it and can feel as a new player, the, the digital side of it makes it a lot easier to take when you say, well, I clicked on the thing. Why can I do the thing? Oh, I can't do the thing versus like your buddy says, well, you can't do that. Well, you know, of course you'd tell me that I can't do that. That's advantageous to you because what I would do is be super cool. And like your buddy just goes, mechanically, that's not how that works. Okay. But it's like, it's easier <laughs> when a computer tells you versus your friend. So mm -hmm. when that client comes in, you say, you know, hey, you know, try this thing. If you like it, great. Here's what I recommend for a commander pre-con. You could build your own. 
but generally speaking, the commander decks are built in a specific way to encourage you know, exploration and you know, tinkering with. So you know, your buddies will tell you these decks are bad. They're not. They're designed in a specific way, and that a normal magic deck is built around having a really good core strategy that you've got a synergy or a plan in mind of what you're looking to do. And when it comes to sort of like how you implement that, you have a very directed approach to all the cards that you're doing feeds your strategy. And the commander precons and all the magic precons are built in such a way that they say, we're not going to prejudge what you think you'll be interested in. So mm -hmm. here's this three color combination. It can do like 12 different things. And we're going to give you a little bit of each one. And the idea is that you play it and go, cool. Every time I played this card, it was awesome and great. Every time I got this card, I'm like, damn it. <laughs> like, you know, like that's yeah. the, the, you know, and part of it is that play them unmodified because that'll give you a feeling for what works and what doesn't and what you like, you know, not what's good or bad, but, you know, all right, neat. I like having big haymaker plays or I like having like, you know, really sneaky, like finesse plays, you know. Yeah, find out if you're a Tibby, a Johnny, or Spike, yeah. or whatever part of the game attracts you. Figure that part out. Yeah, and part of it is that you play it as it is, and after you've played like five or six games, you'll figure out what you do and don't like, and that's the part where you start getting the real heart of magic, which is the customization. So yeah. usually when a new player comes in, that's the winning process you do. You sort of figure out, neat, what are you expressing to me that you're interested in? We figure that part out. How would you like to engage in that interest? Is it with the buddies already? Is it with you by yourself? How do you build it up there and make a recommendation based on sort of that? And sometimes the recommendation is, you know, you don't need to buy anything. Like, you know, try it, you know, digitally, try it with your buddies before mm -hmm. you commit. But if you're like, yep, I'm totally, I just want to get a deck today. Awesome, man. That's great. You know, here's what I'd recommend for you. Which one should I pick? Whatever one looks coolest to you is as good a place as any. If you have like a really strong feeling about like a color combination, we'll mm -hmm. pick you something that's in that range. But otherwise, you know. It's, it's all non-judgmental because it's all equally good, especially if you're starting. That's part of that client experience where it's like a lot of times when people come to game stores, that's kind of where they bounce off. You know, they'll sort of, you know, come in, they'll sort of look at some stuff, not, you know, someone will say, well, it's a commander deck. Sometimes they're just, they're pretty bad. Like, you know, that's sometimes the reaction you'll get when yeah. you go to a game store, you know, but, you know, it's something where, you know, you're looking to help that client out and figure out, you know, what it is they're looking for. And if the answer is that, you know, it's something that they don't end up being interested in or it's something where, you know, the answer is that they don't need to get anything today, that's okay. Or even if the answer is that you're like, okay, well, you know, thanks for talking to me. I'm going to go order it on Amazon. All right. You know, that's, you know, it's one of those ones where like some people will take that personally. But I would also say that someone is, you know, <laughs> coming to you to ask questions and if they are the kind of person who's going to do that and want to order the best possible option, again, that's a client choice. And all you can sort of do in those cases is just have the availability for it and say, okay, cool. We have the stuff. If you need it, if Amazon, like if someone steals it off your porch, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know like it, that sucks, but you know, or it shows up and it's a repacked box of, you know, masters or what have you, like, you know, you know, it's, it's something where like you, you, you can come here and you'll get exactly what you want. You can leave with it today. And that's gotta be one of your selling features of saying it's, it's, mm -hmm. if it's more important for someone to leave, go and save five bucks or 10 bucks online on it, you know, and wait, you know, for it to be shown up that's a client that you weren't winning over anyway to that sort of style. But, you know, they'll most likely be back because you weren't a jackass to them, right? You know, it's like, okay, man, like, you know, like we talked about it. I'm, you know, if you, you know, like we've had people go like, well, you know, I, I you know, one part of the reason I was asking today is because like, I saw like a deal online for like one for like 50 bucks. Man, that's a great price. You should totally get that. Like, yeah. you know, because the reality is, you know, you can be, you know, it's, it's, it's a choices thing, right? Like you can be upset and angry that someone like is, you know, wait, you know, in, in your view, wasting their time. Do it, you know, or you can sort of see it as like, eh, my time is already gone. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you know, if I'm to an asshole this person, they pro they'll never come back. Whereas like, if I'm just like, you know, well, talking about it, it's like, you know, you can also look at it in the long term. Yeah. You look at the big picture, right? Yeah. So that first interaction you have with somebody who says, ah, you know, that's great. Thanks for taking up 20, like, give me 20 minutes of your time. Give yeah. me all your recommendations. I'm going to go buy from somebody else. Yeah. That's great. Right. Like mm, that, that doesn't feel good necessarily, but that could also be seen as a, okay, well, maybe maybe this person will never come back and, you know, they just took advantage of me. That stinks. But there's a pretty good chance that they're going to buy that thing and then they're probably going to come back to you again to be like, well, you gave me a great, you know, I love this thing. You gave me great advice. What else do you got? Oh, yeah. well, I, I can't find that online. I can't get these. You, know, you can't buy oh, yeah. magic there's, singles there's a, on Amazon right now. Oh, yeah. There's a value to sort of like having a relationship and an, an approach that says, you know, we're here to provide a service and an experience, you know, and someone will either appreciate that or they won't. And that's totally okay. You know, I'm not here to bully anyone or shame them to shopping with me. That's, that is not my approach. My <laughs> style. You know, my, my, approach Buy is, my, stuff. <laughs> my, my approach is very much, you know, it's a, 
I, and I tell my staff is that, you know, I don't put any sales goals. I don't put any like criteria on them, you know, cause the answer is, you know, if someone is happy, you know, when you're, when your typical person, when your typical client comes in, they have a number in mind when they come shopping with you of what they're expecting to spend. Mm -hmm. Like, so if someone has showed up at our store, they are planning to spend, you know, whatever they have planned in their mind to spend. And sometimes they will spend a little more than that, yeah. you know, but they typically go, well, you know, I came in here, I have a hundred bucks. That's my fun money. I'm looking to spend it. I'm going to find something to spend it on. And your job as a game store is to have something available for them because, you know, support your LGS, support your local store only works insofar as that you have the product to facilitate that need. You know, so like one of the reasons that we stock so deep and so heavy is that we carry one plus of every Warhammer model in stock. We carry, you know, every video game release, you know, you know so much stuff, you know, and part of it is that if someone wants to support their local game store, you know, we've, you know, we've done part of that for them. But, you know, it's, you know, the, the challenge is like, you'll hear shops say, support your LGS. And I've been to a lot of stores and there are stores that I love supporting and love going to, mm -hmm. but they don't have the product mix to make me, you know, if I had 200 bucks, you know, I've gone to stores and I'm like, I really loved it here. This is a really awesome place. You know, I'd, I'd love to support you. Um, it's something where the, you know, I would love to spend $500 plus with you. And I just, I'm struggling to find like a hundred yeah. bucks to spend. I don't want to just pick up a bunch of random board games that I'm never going to play. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've a hundred percent gone to stores that I've absolutely loved and spent money there. Uh, where it's like, I in no way, shape or form needed this, but I, I wanted to feel like I, I spent something to support them. Um, and part of that is, you know, just having the inventory available, you know, having stuff you know, think, and I'm not talking about like high end foils or things like that, like yeah. you know, stuff that's like an unreasonable ask to kind of have, have a store in play, but you know, it's something where if you want your community to support you, you have to have the, the products that they actually want to have. And if you don't have that, it's very hard for them to sort of like, you know, support you as a store. So like when we got into Warhammer, uh, we had initially carried the best sellers line for, for GW. Basically, it's a list of their products that say, okay, you know, GW says that these products turn the most frequently. You know, these are the most, like, you know, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily the most, like, you know, pop, you know, not necessarily the best models, but things that sell the most of, like, starter yeah. product. Um, and we carried that. And for, we carried that for six months, a bit, I think maybe almost a year. Um, and in that time, we had people come in, go, oh, man, I was looking for this thing. It's like, oh, well, we don't have that, but I can order it in. It'll be here in, like, two, three days. Like, no, nah, that's okay. I'm, I'm good. Um, and enough of that happened where I realized that, you know, if we wanted to make those clients happy, we had to have what they were looking for because wait two or three days for it is not an appropriate answer for that client who wants it today. It's why they're coming yeah. to the store. They want it now. They don't want to come back in a few days. They don't want to deal with me saying, Hey, the order got delayed by like a, you know, a yeah. day or so, you know, UPS ate my stuff. Like, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, it's like, they don't want to hear it. What they're here for is to support you, but also to have the thing that you wanted when they wanted it. Um, so with that sort of thing, we committed and saying, okay, well, if we're going to carry this and what our clients are saying is that they want to have, you know, they want to be able to walk in and walk out with it. We need to order and carry product in a way that is, makes sense for that. You know, so we basically mm -hmm. made a commitment to sort of like carry more stock of it. Um, and it's, you know, it's got to the point now where like we have, you know, we have, you know, not only the stuff that they carry in like a traditional GW store, mm -hmm. um, but also all the web exclusive items that, you know, you can order as a retailer. Um, most stores don't because it's a lot of products to sort of like carry that may or may not sell in a timely fashion, right? So if you're worried about like product turnover, um, carrying the whole you know, web only range is a, you know, is a tough ask. Um, but the benefit that we found for it, for us in our position is that it's something where, you know, it means we have, a, you know, for something that is sort of like, you know, broadly generic as GW products, like box of space Marines, we have unique items within that range. So there's things like, oh my gosh, what, there's a bunch of like, like the Trigon for like the Tyranids army is like a web only item. It's not an army, uh, not, it's not a model that's seeing a whole lot of competitive play, but it's a really cool model that a lot of casual players looking for that no one really kind of stocks because it's such a, it's a big box model. It's a hundred bucks. It's something where it's a, a lot of the, the usage case of it's a little weird, but someone who walked in, so we had someone come in yesterday who was like, oh my God, I've only ever seen this thing on the online store yeah. and I've always sort of like, hesitated about picking up because oh, I don't really need it or have a use for it, but it's such a cool model. And it's you know, right there. But it's right there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, that's fair, man. <laughs> like, so it's like, so, you know, and, but that's the kind of thing, like, that's a customer, you know, that, that's where you're adding value for your clients. And it's something where, you know, 
knowing that that's part of their experience before they know it is a big, a big part of what makes us successful. Yeah. Yeah. Like it makes me think of opportunity cost, yep. right? Like you don't know what you're missing out on by not having something, oh, exactly. right? It'd be really interesting to get a, like to do a AB test, two timelines kind of scenario where you have, uh, you know, your approach where the deck box has massive selection, right? Like that, to me, that sounds like a, a big part of the USP, right? Yep. You could come into the deck box and say, I want these cards. Probably got them. Yep. Probably have everything that you need, right? Yep. And that is a, that's a, that's a value that not every store can offer, no. right? Not every store has it's, the ability it's to or wants It's to. definitely a high bar. But if you compared that with, okay, so you've got 99% coverage, right? Yep. And I've, I've had other stores uh, on the podcast who, that's their thing. They got 99% of every magic card ever printed, right? Most, and they try to keep it always in stock as much as they can. And that's the reason why customers come to them. But if it was, let's say, 80% or 60 or 50 or like, you know, you just kind of did it at like that 20%. I only carry the standard stuff that's just been released in the last three months. Yeah. What would the difference in, you know, customer satisfaction and like the sale volume and revenue, like how would that affect things? Is there a, you know, a multiplier at 100% that just like, makes it worth it that you've invested because that's a lot, right? That's a, that's, that's a lot of inventory. <laughs> is a fair bit. So I would say in terms of how we view it is that the, you know, it's one of those things that what you're selling as a game store outside of sort of like new release product where that's kind of, you know, for the most part, if your allocation is good, you can kind of have whatever you need for that. So if you say you want, you know, 200 box of a new set release, you can probably get that assuming you've sort of like built up with your distributor that you, mm -hmm. you like, that that's a level that you go through. Um, whereas with, you know, more vintage stuff, it's a little more tricky. So I would say that, you know, in terms of there is a cost of carrying so much product. Um, but part of that is, you know, it, it does generate sales in long term. but I think that's part of where you see like that slow build model where you don't start off with everything, but you start off with like kind of the greatest hits and sort of, you know, build a client relationship. And when a client, you know, so, cause the biggest thing is this, is that when you, when you treat them, treat people like clients instead of customers, you know, a client. And I know if I bring in this, you know, reserve list dual land, you know, I've got a guy for that. Mm -hmm. You know, you as a seller bring me something, you don't know the guy, but I know the guy and I know, yeah. cool. I give you, I give you 50% in cash or 70% in trade for that thing that you've got. I know a client, I know a buyer and you know, I, it's not a guarantee, but I know that if I reach out to that person or if I make a social post where I throw it up, that that person is going to message me or say, Hey man, like, can you hold this? Like, yeah. you know, and it's, you know, it's something where when you have that level of client knowledge, you can make those bigger plays. So basically saying, okay, you know, you know, seeing, you know, you know, it's not just a, have this thing, didn't have it walked out, no kind of collective memory about what happened. It's a, oh, Todd was in looking for, you know, exalted eight bound me. I'll put a hold notification on it for when it's in. I'll do, you know, we order regularly from GW. You know, but I'll do a special direct order so that that he just gets his stuff. So when he comes in, I'll like you know I'll just message him and say, "Hey, this showed up for you. Came back in stock. You know, we got it for you. If you need it, awesome. If you've already got somewhere else, no big deal. We'll fill a hole in the wall with it." Um, but it's some it's that sort of like qualified buying where you go, okay, I know this person wants this thing, mm -hmm. and I know if I'm out of it, you know, you know everyone else is probably out of it. So if I make the effort to go have the thing before someone else, before a regular free stock or regular thing comes in. Now I just have it kind of, you know, all available. It's a reliable sale. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, not information or knowledge that you get without that relationship, right? Exactly. If it's all right. transactional. Yeah. You'll never know what they really want. Yeah. You can kind of glean based off of what they bought, they purchased. The yeah. Past, Cause they, but... cause they may look at the wall of stuff and like, kind of like browse a bit and go and just leave and go. Like, yeah. And they'll never tell you. Like, they'll hey. never tell you. Whereas if you have a conversation and go, Hey man, what you looking for today? Anything excited? You know, like, you know, there's the conversational nature and they say, yeah, man, I was looking for a trigon, but you're out of stock of ones. Like, Oh yeah. Like, if you just, I'll just grab your number and when it comes in, we just give you a call. Like, you know, if you find in the meantime, no big deal. We're just going to restock it anyway. But like, you know, yeah. you get first pass on her. Um, and that's the kind of thing where like, if you don't engage with them as clients and you just treat it strictly as customers, you will never get that level of knowledge and you'll miss that sale. So, you know, it's a hundred dollar sale that a little bit of conversation and a little bit of engagement, you know, and a mm -hmm. little bit of legwork gets you right. You know, it's something where there's a value to that. Whereas you no, know, you know, and that's, you know, you have to be able to back up that client relationship with having what they want, because if you just don't have what they want, no matter relationship in the world is going to change. They're going, cool. I really need this card for my deck. It's the thing that makes it work. You know, 
you know, I'd love, love, love to buy it from you. I'm willing to give you some time. I'm willing to give you some patience on it to, you know, to, to get it kind of figured out. Um, but I, but I want this and if you can't get it for me, I'm willing to delay, but I'm eventually going to get it from somebody. Yeah. So like, that's part of the element of, you know, sort of saying, you know, you want to have that inventory to support, you know, the clients who want to shop with you, you know, the clients who want to say, okay, I'd really like to buy this from you because I, I like you and I want to support you. You need to have that inventory to make that sale because it doesn't make you any benefit if there's no ability to sort of, you know, you know to have that sale materialize because otherwise you'll just go, okay, well, you know, this guy's been waiting on me for like three months to like yeah. get this thing for him. You know, I'd never get around to it or I don't do whatever. And he's eventually going to buy it from somebody else. So by the time I get the thing back in, all he's going to remember when I call him is saying, Oh yeah. You know, like, you know, I, I waited for like six months for you to figure this out and I just went and bought it. Right. It's like, you know, yeah. it's like, it's like, so that's, that's a part of it. Right. And so you're, what level do you stock to? I think the answer is that, you know, if you, I think you don't need as large of a blanket approach. If you truly know your customer, you know your client base and don't mm. just treat them as customers. Cause if you're treating them as customers, you may not get that information and no amount of stocking will sort of be like, cool. I have 90% of this stuff, but he wants that, like, not th that thing, yeah. that thing that falls out of the 90% range, what somebody might want or care for, you know, he falls outside of that. So I'm never going to satisfy that customer, even if I'm at like 90 or 92%, if I don't have that unique thing they're looking for. And you don't know that unless you're training as a client experience rather than as a customer experience. I want to go back to the singles. Sure. Cause, uh, you know, conversations, topics yep. move forward, but totally. yeah, the, uh, with the singles. So, what would you say your pricing level compares at? Would you consider like, oh, we're above market, where we try to be, you know, like roughly equal to DCG sure. mid or whatever? How does that work? Yeah. So typically how we do our stuff uh, is for years, we sort of pegged it to different things. Like just going back with uh, Star City used to be sort of like the, the peg price and then mm -hmm. face and then the sort of TCG. Um, and what we've done over the years is we've instituted, you know, pretty standard stuff for a store, you know, uh, an LGS is, you know, minimums and stuff's like uh, uncommon is like, a minimum of, a, or sorry, a common is like a minimum of a quarter and uncommon is 50 cents. The rare is like two bucks, you know, mythics like three to five. Um, and we found that that was helpful for us, not only because it was something where, you know, that's a level at which, you know, it justifies opening inventory for. So you'll mm -hmm. see some things online where it's like, cool, this card's a nickel or this card's like, you know, 10 cents, you know, on a practical level to pay my guys, like, you know, you know, what yeah. we pay them because we pay them well, um, you know, that doesn't make sense. Like if you're, if you have like a hundred card commander list, that's nothing but, you know, commons and uncommons and TCG players sign that list for like a grand total, like 15 bucks, yep. you know, like, you know, the hour it's going to take to pull that list is not worth it from a man hour perspective, just to pull the list, you know, let alone the processing it took to get all of those cards into the system. So while we are more expensive on some of the cheaper stuff, you know, mm -hmm. with the minimum, so like, you know, a card's not going to be five cents, it's going to be 25 cents. And that has an added effect of making your order more expensive. We generally tend to be cheaper on the higher end stuff. So okay. how it balances out is if you're, if you're looking for value for, from us, you know, I would say that typically our low end stuff tends to be um, a little more expensive on average, whereas our higher end stuff tends to be under market by like 10% or more for, for the most part. But yeah, so as far as that goes, it's a you know, we tend to find that the single side of it is something where it's always in flux and all you can really sort of do is sort of say, yeah. you know, this is what makes sense for our market. Uh, it's part of why we don't sell online. Uh, it allows us to sort of insulate our, our retail experience from sort of like bigger market forces. So for example, I wanted like, to ask about that too. Yeah. So for example, like, you know, one of the benefits of just being a store that sells in person is that we have the ability to sort of set prices that reflect our market. So a lot of times what you'll see online is you'll see, a card gets specced on or bought out and you'll mm -hmm. see jump to like ludicrous prices. Yep. So like a good example is like a sliver hive, you know, it's a basic rare from M15, you know, prior to spike, it was like a three to $5 card at the height of the spike. I think it was like 20 bucks, 30 bucks. Um, but it's something where like that level of demand or that price point isn't backed up by the organic, you know, demand that we have from our, from our clients, mm -hmm. you know, so it's something where like I could ratchet it up to 20 bucks to be in line with the market, but that doesn't feel good to my clients. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, you know, it's something where like they go, well, why, you know, this card is like, you know, uh, you know, there's no clients say, I perceive this card as like a five to a $10 card yeah. at 30 bucks. I'm not interested. Cause like, that's like more than what I want to pay for 
a land that taps for any color and makes a sliver, right? Like, you know, that's, that's you know, that, that's, it's outside of what they would, you know, want to spend on that sort of as a card effect. Mm. Um, and it's something where being able to be in touch with these games, be able to kind of pick price points, makes it so that you, you know, you have a better understanding of saying, okay, card like children, you know, came out, mm, it was like 50 bucks. It's up to around like a hundred and change right now, you know, and when it came out, and seeing the play go, okay, well, you know, it is clearly a hundred dollar card, you know, until it gets mm -hmm. a reprint somewhere along the line, cards a hundred bucks yeah. because it's just absolutely bonkers. You play it in constructed formats, you play it in casual formats, you know, it is, it is just a really good effect. And the challenge, you know, when you, you know, so the challenge with pricing is it always needs to be reflective of, in our case, our local market, you know, so we'll have some things that are a little higher than average and we'll have some things that are lower than average. And if you really want to find good deals, you totally can. But it's something where, you know, we price it based on our market demand that we see for it. You know, so some things are higher, some things are lower, and an average it balances out a fair bit. And that comes from ear to the ground, paying so, attention. Yeah. And also part of it is like we open a lot of product. So mm -hmm. we have a fair bit of leverage when it comes to our price point. So when a new set comes out, we'll open some of the neighborhood like 2,000 packs, give or take, uh, depending on the set. So that means that when a new set launches, we have, you know, play sets upon play sets of like everything mm -hmm. so we can sort of put out and say okay well you know you know i have 62 of this rare you know it's yeah. like all right it's like you know if, I, if it's a five buck rare and it jumps up to like someone online it's like twenty dollars we'll see what the organic sell through is on our end you know and sort of adjust it accordingly you know it's something where you know if you're using something like you know um, binder pos where it has yeah. like automatic updates and pricing um that's really helpful if you you know, are don't want to either you don't want to keep up on sort of day-to-day -day market fluctuations um, and want to have it automated or you're not super familiar with singles but you feel that you should sell them anyway and you don't want to get sharked by someone of you know, sort of saying yeah. you know um, it's a good way to do it i tend to find that in my experience that while cards move in price points most of the really big jumps are mm -hmm. easy enough to see if you're sort of like you know in those ecosystems so if you're on like you know you know the, the like yeah, so I'm not a really huge online person, but I keep, you know, sort of, you know, you know limited accounts on like stuff like, you know, MPG Finance or like, you know, with like some of the stock movement stuff for it. Um, mainly because like, you know, usually if someone's coming to you to buy out a card, it's not because they figured it out themselves. It's because yeah. they saw like an MPG stocks report where it's like, this card went up 70%. And it's like, all right, well, I, I also got the, I got the email notification. This article went live, looked at it, said, yeah, that, that, that increases bullshit, you know, but these yeah. ones seem pretty real. So like, we'll adjust a little bit here and there. You know, but like, you know, if you're doing that sort of stuff, you're going to catch most of that movement. And when you get out of the pricing mindset of saying, I need to be exactly like TCG player, I need to be exactly this price point. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff doesn't fluctuate all that much. So like, you know, if you say a rare is a minimum of $2, most of them are in around that price point. Sometimes it's two twenty five, sometimes yeah. it's a buck 75, sometimes it's 90 cents. Like it's all stuff where it fluctuates and moves. But in terms of having to go reprice it and adjust it, you can just put two bucks on it and say, cool, if it gets up to three and I sell it entirely, I'll reprice it to three. But if not, yeah, whatever, if you got it for 250, you know, you know it's 250 or you got it for it's four and you got it for two bucks, and I still have a bunch of them. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's just yeah. a, it's a matter of, oops, sorry. it's a matter of having it kind of all balance out, you know, so if you can do a lot of leg work running around trying to like do micro fixes and stuff, or you can just say, Neat, you know, I'll, I'll adjust it as needed. Yeah, here's enough of a pricing buffer, and yeah. there's enough margin built into everything else that yeah, fluctuations. It's, it's kind part of, of why we do mythics at five dollars. You know, so if, you know, for if a for a mythic to go from sort of like a bulk mythic to like more than that five dollar range, is takes a lot, and something needs to come come out to push it. So like either like a new deck or a new card interaction that moves its sort of perceived value. Um, whereas you know, having it in that filter range goes okay. Well, you know, it went from three dollars to six dollars. Okay, cool. Like it's, you know, it's, it means that, you know, but the value of just having it, you know, nearby in immediacy is just a, it's a big benefit. How much do you feel like this is you? How much of the deck box, the deck box is you? Oh, when we first started out, a good chunk of it was me and Rachel. Um, now it's a little less, it's grown bigger than we are. Um, you know, like I said, we have around a hundred plus transactions on an average day. So like, it, it can't be me anymore. Like it's, yeah. it's, you know, you know, I am a part of it. I am sort of you know, around a lot, but it's also something where, you know, you know, I want, you know, our clients to have interactions with, you know, our staff that, you know, are their own interactions. So we have people who will come in on days that they know staff are working 
because I like them and they want to like socialize and like check in with their stuff, you know, and that's, you know, something where I've always encouraged that because I want, you know, you know, I want, you know, the business to be more than just me. You know, I mm. want the, to be able to operate with in my absence, you know, because when we, when we did this, when our, going back a little bit. So when we did our store in Summerside and we did our expansion here, mm. um, I realized that I'd made a mistake a bit in Summerside in that, you know, when we had opened up here, um, Rachel stayed behind to run the store there and I moved to Halifax to run the store here. Mm. And we found out that, you know, through feedback she got from clients is that I'm saying, well, you know, Josh isn't here anymore. And we'd really like to have a game store here, but you know, we, you know, we don't think, you know, because you're, because you're not Josh, you know, like, you yeah. know, we, you know, we're just not going to come around as much um, because I hadn't built up someone to be a replacement me, you know, that I had run mm -hmm. the business as a way of being like, if you wanted anything at all, you talk to me. And now if you want anything, the staff are there for you. And I'm, I'm around all like, I'm there to say, hi, I engage with people. I do kind of all the stuff I love to do, but by and large, I, you know, when I can, I will direct you to one of our staff for it. Mainly because, you know, I want them to feel like I don't want to be that game store where someone goes in, well, I need to talk to just Josh. He's the only one who can help me. It's like, no, all of these yeah. people are very talented and very wonderful people that we've hired. You know, I don't hire assholes. Um, you know, <laughs> I hope not. yeah, um, not intentionally. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like the, the, the experience for it is such that I want them to the staff to feel like they're being elevated, that if they mm. make a decision or make a recommendation that, you know, that someone's not second guessing them, you know, behind it saying, okay, well, you should have done this. It's like, you no, know, it's a, you know, they've got an opinion, they've got, you know, a, you know, a thing they want to communicate and that's you know, something I'm happy to support. So I'd say, yes, in the beginning it was definitely, you know, very much a, a two person show. And mm -hmm. as we've grown, we've moved away from that a fair bit. So, you know, I'm still very active in our day to day operations. I'm around a lot cause I like my job. Um, sure. but you know, it's something where, you know, just even now, like, you know, we have, we have five full-time staff members outside myself and Rachel. Um, we have sort of, you know, a couple of support, uh, you know, staff as well too, who do like kind of behind the scenes stuff mm -hmm. uh, for like content creation and products and processing and that sort of stuff. Um, but it's something where, this store doesn't run with anything less than sort of like five people kind of working at it full time um, because there's just, there's too many communities to you know, help and there's too many things to kind of manage. You know, it's something where like, you know, you know, if I really delude myself, I could probably say, well, me and Rachel could probably run it ourselves for a bit, but like, that's not sustainable. Yeah. And I like got a lot of stores start out that way, right? Like that's pretty much like, oh, totally. almost a universal experience is that the store and the person running the store or owning the store are the same thing. Oh yeah. It's, it's very entwined. And I would say that in my mind, that's a good way to start out because no mm -hmm. one will be as you know, into the process of making your store better. If that's what you want to do as you will be. So like, you yeah. know, you know, and some of the times that you have seen friction with, you know, staff and store owners is that, you know, your staff not being as dedicated as a store owner would like them to be, which is an unreasonable bar, right? You know, I, and I, I, make store. It, yeah, I make it very clear to my staff saying, look, you know, you work here, you know, I, I, I love having you here. I would highly encourage you that, you know, if you are going to, you know, work for us, um, make a firm stance on your personal side of it that, you know, if you're not on the clock, you're not answering someone's questions, you know, like, you know, if you're, if you, mm -hmm. if you have a relationship with them and want to talk stuff, totally do it. But if you are like the start messaging going, Hey, what would this trade in for? Hey, you know, like, you know, do you have this in stock? And like, you know, you know, Hey, when's this event? Like, you know, just yeah. don't answer those conversations. I don't expect that of you. I don't want you to have to worry about that. Just do your stuff. you like, you show up, you work, you know, your shift, you go home at the end of the day. That's it. You know, like there's no sort of like, you no, know, I, you know, I don't expect, you know, anything more than you than that. I, mean, I expect you to show up and be friendly, do your job, engage with people. If it's a shitty sales day, yeah, like, you know, that's, that's not on you. You know, I'm not going to, you know, get upset about you know, if we made like, you know, under you didn't hit your trick. quota. <laughs> yeah. Like there, there, there's none of that. It's very much a, you know, the only thing I ask is if we were like dead for whatever reason that we tied you some stuff. Like if, if I come in and the sales are lower than I would have hoped for the day, you know, if you can point to it and say, well, we did a couple of big buys and trade-ins, we restocked the sleeve wall. Cool. That's good. Like not every day is going to be a gangbusters. Not every day is going to be like setting the world on fire, you know, and you need some amount of days like that to just reset. Yeah. And get some cleaning done. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, that's definitely a pro <laughs> always a process. Yeah. Well, that never ends. You no. know, life is a never ending struggle against entropy. Oh yeah. No, that's fair. <laughs>
how autonomous would you say your employees are? Like how much leeway do you give them to be like, ah, offer this much in traded value? Sure. What do you, like how do you do so deal with all get, that? So this will get a little to the back end side of it. But uh, so as far as we do for autonomy is that my staff are empowered to sort of, you know, make the decisions that they think are correct in, the ter in terms of like client servicing a client. Mm. So it's something if someone comes in and, you know, they're asking for a little extra, a little more, it's on the staff to sort of like, you know, figure out if that's something that they, you know, you know, be, you know that they make an exception for. So something like, you know, someone comes in and goes, hey, man, like I'm out of top loaders. You have a couple I can borrow? Sure. You know, you can have a couple top loaders. Not a big deal. Hey, hey man, he can, I came back in last week and asked about top loaders. Can I have some more? All right. Well, you know, yeah. here, here's a pack of twenty five of them or five bucks. Like, yeah. you know, like it's it's that level of you know nuance, and it's something where as far as our staff goes, the back end system for pricing is set by me. Um, they have the ability to adjust them, um, and they'll do it within reason. So basically, if you come to them and say, "Hey, you know this, you know I've got this list of cards. All this looks fine. This one card on there seems a little off. Can you check it for me?" They're empowered to do that and make an adjustment. If it's that you're like looking like, okay, well, you know, I'm fine with these three cards because they're under what I expected them to be. And these seven cards, like, can you check them for me? Mm -hmm. The answer is probably not. You know, it's something where it's like, it's that reciprocity back and forth. And that's something that we train for our staff. And it's something where I would say that, you know, the buying side of it is also automated in the same way. So we talked a little mm -hmm. off camera about uh, Lightspeed, which we use for our yeah. point of sale. And it allows you to set kind of your own prices on your, your inventory back there. It's not meant for card games, but we use it for our store and it's pretty effective. So basically all of our buy stuff, it's pretty straightforward. So anyone can process a buy on our end that you bring in your cards, we put them into our system line by line. We'll give you an itemized pr breakdown for each one and say, cool, this is worth this much in cash. And we do a 40% bonus on top of it to get that 70% in trade rate. Mm -hmm. But it's something like with that, there's an ability to sort of say, oh, cool. We're out of stock of this. It says that this card is $10 in our system. We're giving five bucks on it, but we're out of it. Let's do a price check to see, oh, card's gone up to 20 bucks. Yeah, we'll move that up to $10 for the buy price and you know, you know move it up to 20 for the sell. So there's that level of autonomy that they do have for it. And it's something where you know we have gradations of that, especially when it comes to buys. So like, you know, the first thing we train you on is for like processing buys through, you know, and once you get comfortable with that, you know, price adjustments are generally something where I get final say on it. But mm -hmm. by and large, if it's something minor, like, you know, it's something like that where it's like a $10 card went to a $20 card. My staff aren't going to check in with me on that, but if like, a, that's the, a, a, is there other thresholds for where the person's like, yep, usually you know, it's 50 bucks or more. Now it's, uh, it's usually, by the boss. Yeah, usually for like a buy. So like you know, the nice part is because it's all digital is that I can check our inventory from wherever I'm at. So, cool. you know, when there's a, like a buy on it, basically they'll send me a text and say, Hey, purchase order number, whatever, you know, need your approval because you know, it's a little on the high side, and you know, and generally the threshold is like, it's like, if it's like, if we're doing like more than 150 bucks in cash on it, depending on how busy I am, if I'm like away at a tournament, I'll say, cool. The threshold is if it's under 500 bucks, don't bug me about it. Like, I don't want to know. Like, you know, if it, if it okay. checks, it, if it checks out and you think it looks fine, you know, you know, we'll send the transfer and, you know, we'll call it a day, you know, but if it's, you know, but if I'm just kind of around, yeah, like 200 bucks or something, like just like run it by me for the most part, which is something where like we do regular trade-ins and, you know, we'll get like a $500 trade in plus like eh, once every couple of days, if not more than that, depending on where it's at. Okay. Um, but it's something where the, you know, if the vast, vast majority of buys will trade to be like sub a hundred dollars, kind of something like that. You know, it's, you know, I generally won't look at those and I'll, we have a, a review process where basically they'll do the buy, the client will get paid. And then there's a step where I go in afterwards and do a review. It's like, okay, cool. We did this buy, you know, conditions were in line with what we had expected for it or, this was slightly wrong or this was like a little more worn than I would give. And we'll, and I'll give notes to my guys and say, Hey, yeah. you bought this, you know, it was a different version of the thing. The price point is within reason and, you know, and we'll contact the, the seller if it's a little off and we'll just send them the extra credit. Um, if it's off in the seller's favor, we generally don't, we, don't, we just let it go. Uh, but it's something where I use that as a, a learning tool for the staff. It's like saying, Hey okay. man, like you saw this thing. And I get why you thought that it was this set, but this little like planeswalker symbol in the corner means it was the reprint. So it's worth like half of what the actual one is. Um, but it's that sort of stuff where it's a, the buying process. They have a, fair, a bit of autonomy, you know, and the counter interaction stuff, they have a, a, a bit more. Um, but it's something where like, it's a matter of empowering your staff to make good decisions in the moment. So they're not always having to run back to you to check in, you know, so like I am around and I'm there if they need something or if they need to step in because mm -hmm. you know, something needs to be decided. It's a little more, like if someone's looking at like, you know, you know, dual lands and going, okay, well, you know, 
you know, uh, you know I want to spend 500 bucks on this car. You know, it's, um, can you like, can you make me feel good about the purchase? Like, cool, right, we'll talk, we'll walk through it. This is the notable things. This is why we have it marked here. Yeah, you know, you're right. There's one online for like, you know, 600, but you know, the scratch here and this like little discoloration, we moved it down to the 500 range. Yeah. So like, you're not, it's not near mint, but it's off the sticker does that. But like, that's the sort of like the fine detailing stuff where it's like having that experience makes someone feel better about that experience, that, that process, you know, that they, yeah. okay, you know, I know what I'm looking at. I know this guy knows what he's talking about. And, you know, the thing is priced appropriately. It's like, you know, or if it's like, you know, beat the shit, it's like, cool, this one's 250 bucks. Why? Because someone loved it with a hammer. Like that's just, you know, <laughs> that's just how it goes. Not every card is, not every card gets to be pretty. <laughs> yeah. And then I want to zoom out for a second, but also like the fact is, you know, a $500 purchase is not a small purchase for most people. That's a pretty big, pretty big transaction, right? Like oh, yeah. to expect that the guy would be like, yeah, here you go. Here's my money. I don't need to talk about this. I don't need to interact with anyone. Yeah. You would need to do a little bit of hand selling for for a little bit items of that. along the I find that for usually for people in that range, they generally know what they're looking for, and that's going back to that sort of like that that client experience of you know. Generally speaking, it's not an unsolicited buy of like something in that range that comes the door. Generally speaking, when it happens, it's someone that you know. You're like, okay, yeah, this guy's been talking about it, or I know that he's the kind of guy who, when he spends, he just you know he doesn't buy a lot of little stuff, but he's going to buy like a couple bigger ticket things in a go. Or I know that he's, you know, you know, Navy. So that means that he's, you know, he was out to sea for six months. He come back with, you know, you know, sale Lots pay. Of cash. And, and you're like, <laughs> you know, like this is the, you know, he's been thinking about this the entire time about how he's going to get, you know, the last couple duels to finish off his commander deck, you know, and that's like how he put up with all like the, the shit at work that he dealt with. <laughs> um, and that's the, you know, and so like, again, it's one of those ones, like you generally don't get unsolicited sales like that, but when you, you do get that sale, you want to connect with the person because you know why he's spending like this. Like, oh man, like you're finally pulling the trigger to get like your scrub land to finish off your deck. Awesome. How was the sale? Like, did you know, like, you know, where, where you know, now that you're back, where did you go? Right? Like, yeah. you, know, you can't tell me beforehand, but like, you know, but like stuff like that, or like someone will come in excited because they got like a bonus at work or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's something where that client experience is a big part of, you know, it's a bigger sale. Yeah. But it's also something where someone generally wants to talk about it, you know, and you yeah, want to make excited about it. Yeah, and make you want to make them it. and you want to make them have a good experience and not just have it be a transaction. Because mm -hmm. you know that because they come in, know what they want, they've been thinking about it for a while when they're buying something in that range, you know, and it's something where they go, Well, you know, you know, if it's just a transactional experience, it can feel a little deflating, right? Like, you know, yeah. I, I bought this thing, it was really cool, I'm super hyped about it, and you just rang me through and passed my stuff and it's on my way. Yeah, there's no fanfare, there's yeah. nothing like that. Yeah, you want to feel a bit special, right? You know, it's it's like any sort of niche retail. You, you want to make someone feel that they had a good experience and not only got the thing they wanted, but they got it in the way that they wanted it. You know, that was a, that they felt, you know, you know, that they that it felt good. It's funny. We should give some context. <laughs> Cause like so much of what we talked about before hitting the record button, yeah. I feel like it just kind of like became the background to this conversation. Yeah. So like, but the listeners, they have no idea. <laughs> so what, what is a normal day like at the deck bar? Like give them oh. an idea of what the store feels like, how many people are coming in and out. You mentioned the, the number of transactions. Oh, sure. So yeah, so we are, uh, we're a relatively large store. So we have uh, 4,000 square feet ish. Uh, 1,200 of that is the space we're sitting in right now, which is our uh, are basically our private booking slash recording studio. Mm. Um, so we use it for birthday parties and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's Super really cool. cool. It's a gaming speakeasy. So we have like a front facing bookcase that moves. It's, it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, and then it's we called have the rules lawyer. It's called the rules lawyers or is our fake front. <laughs> Great name. Um, so we have this spot, uh, but our day-to-day -day operations is next door and our day-to-day -day operations is about 2,800 square feet, 2,700 square feet. Um, and that is a large open space. Uh, basically, we have it divided between one part is our retail operation, which basically has like a circular ring where all of our display cases are, and the staff are behind the counters, and there's sort of just product along the wall. So we carry everything from full range of Warhammer, D&D, all the supplemental RPGs you've never heard of, a uh, whole bunch of video games, uh, new and used. Uh, we do Pokemon, we do Magic. We have a binder for every Magic set released. Uh, we have a binder for most of the Pokemon sets kind of before like, Jumping from from black well from black and white base all the way up to present day and then a little bit for the older stuff. Uh, we're rebuilding our single selection for the older stuff just because like during the pandemic that stuff just went. Um, but true. yeah, we basically have browsable binders for every set in, in that there's out there. We have uh, you didn't see it, but we have uh, foil bins uh, sort of by price point and by color. So if you want to go really baller, we have a bin that starts at thirty dollars plus. 
uh, that's full of, you know, mm -hmm. it's, they're in a penny sleeve, or sorry, they're in a perfect fit with a label and the price inside of a top loader. Um, so basically you can browse through for what you're looking for, for the higher end stuff, or we just have boxes that are sub $30 where they're same thing, perfect fit, you know, label on. So you know what you're looking at. Everything in our store is priced because I hate not having stickers on stuff. So like if you see it and it's a ridiculous price, you know, it, it's the price is labeled. If it's too high, let me know and I'll take a look at it and we'll adjust it. Um, but yeah, as far as like our day-to-day -day op stuff, we run seven days a week uh, from 12 to 10. Uh, we have events in the evening, every evening starting at 6.30. Uh, generally speaking, our events are anywhere. Be a quiet event for us will be about 20-ish players will be kind of on the quieter side. Uh, our busiest ones would be like 60 plus. So we had a Friday night was our casual commander and that was 65 players, um, which isn't outside the norm. That's usually like 55, 60. Um, and as far as that goes, we are a very busy store. Uh, so if you walk in and there are less than six people in shopping, it's probably a quiet day. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, that's, you know, a, you know, having a dozen plus people in just kind of actively, you know, engaged is not unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, and on to like launch weekends, it gets, it gets wild. <laughs> I imagine. But yeah, so we typically for as like far as store owners, store owners go, we have about a hundred and our average day is about 120 transactions. Some days will be lower. And on like release days, we'll have like 200 plus transactions. It's kids busy. <laughs> yes, yes. And I want to well, hopefully like. Oh, oh yes. Some... Sorry. I should add because um, I always forget this part because I'm used to it. Um, we have a very distinctive artistic style uh, that we, yes. uh, I, it's very colorful. It's very bright. Um, it's very graffiti inspired, um, which is basically a whole bunch of characters. If you haven't seen it in person, I definitely recommend it. There's pictures of it online on our socials, but um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's real fun. It's one of my favorite parts of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping to splice some stuff in to the video oh, so sure. that people can see like what this looks like and uh, oh, get a sense cool of what the, what the shop is like. Yeah. That's one of the advantages of actually doing this in person because I yeah. can actually see it, see it with yeah. my own two eyes. Yeah, we're, we're a very cool, aesthetically looking store. Uh, we go for sort of a, you know, an approachable niche sort of thing. So like we're a little different than some of the, you know, stores that you'll see out there from more like traditional game stores. Um, you know, everything's labeled, everything's sort of in a nice like orderly spot, you know, everything is divided by sections. So if you're looking for something, you know, all of your Age of Sigmar products is in one section and all that is like done by factions. So it starts with, you know, like, you know, blades of corn and the bees and goes to the S of the Solanesh. Like it's, you know, it, you know, it, you know, if you are if you've never been in before and just sort of see a wall, you'll be able to figure out what you're looking at. And if you can't find something, we're here to help you. Cool. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's that's good context. Like, so people can understand what kind of what does the store feel like. You know how how large are we talking compared to other you know maybe some some smaller local stores who hopefully listen to this podcast and pick up a few things. It's it's a it, we are a big store in terms of like, you know, your average size store. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not like a huge massive store. So you'll see a lot of stores in sort of like um, the Midwest or, you know, where they're like, just like huge amounts of space. Um, we don't sort of go that model, but we are definitely, we prioritize play. So we have a player that seats 60 plus people um, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Uh, very, you know, very nice, sturdy wood tables, um, some nice chairs, you know, and sort of like aesthetics kind of built into all of it. So if you're, if you're playing there, you will know you're playing there versus playing somewhere else. During the tour, you, uh, you mentioned the uh, well, the TVs that you have set up at every yeah. every table, the the advertisements, like the, uh, the the screen running through all the events. Yeah, we have a cycle like of rather than have so like we have we have a static calendar in like two places or sort of advertise so it like tells people kind of what to expect for all of the weekly and monthly stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. But we also have like regular sort of like the, the TVs of user just to kind of say, Hey, this set's coming out. You want to know when the new or canopy release is it's on the screen date, time, all the general details. And there's like a QR code link. You can scan to go buy a ticket or find out more about, you know, kind of a weekly event or what have you. So it's, it's very much designed that if you, you know, are kind of curious about something, you'll be just sort of passively exposed to it and go, Oh, cool. Like, I didn't know there was a master's draft coming up, you know, next Monday. Like I'll just, I'll show up for that. That sounds cool. Like it just, it's, you know, it's to help people kind of like be more, you know, engaged in the community because given the level of business we go, it's not always possible to sort of tell every single soul that walks in all of the things all that the could possibly that do because yeah. it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially since you've got every single day of the week and there's always something going on. That's... Yep. I think that we have at least one event every day of the week and some events are two or three, depending on the day that's going on. So it, get, it keeps busy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy, but like the, the branding is everywhere. That's yeah. one of the things that uh, I really like about your store. And I think it's also one of the reasons why I'm guessing a lot of your clients really like the store is that it feels like you said, it's a destination, right? 
it feels like you're going somewhere and you're in a place and you're immersed in oh, yeah. things that you like, right? The things that you, you know, enjoy. Yeah, it's, it's hard to walk in with, with this and not be excited about something, you know, yeah. and it's one of those things like, you know, it's, you know, it's something where, you know, if you walk into our space, you know, you know, part of the training that we do for staff is that you get greeted. Someone says hi to you, you know, and it's something as simple as like, Hey man, what's up? Like, if I know you, you're like, you know, Hey, you know, like what's going on? Anything I can do for you? It's very much, you know, we're not there to, you know, like be over someone's shoulder, but we want to know that, let them know that they were acknowledged when they came in. Someone was friendly to them, you know, that they, yeah. we want you to be here. If you don't need anything from me, if you just want to browse, totally cool. I'm here, you know. So usually our, our answer is like, you know, it's like, hey, how's you going? Uh, good, you know, like anything you're looking for? No, man, just browsing. Okay, cool. I'm over here if you need me. Just give me a shout. Like, I'm, I'm around. Like it's something where you know you want to make people feel comfortable, you know. And some people come and go. Yeah, I totally had questions about this deck or this thing. Yeah, awesome, man. Let's talk. Like let's 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 engage. But uh, no, it's definitely a very specific atmosphere that we curate. You know, we have a lot of structure. We have a lot of sort of like you know organization that occurs both you know for the client and behind the scenes. Um, but we never want to lose that sort of like in person experience where it's like, you know, yeah. you know, we're not just a warehouse of cool stuff. It's like, <laughs> you know, we, we want to have, you know, that you, that you feel comfortable when you're here and not just that you're like, Oh, well, I need, you know, milk and I need eggs and I need this thing. It's like, it's, it's not that kind of shopping experience. Yeah. Yeah. Despite the, the depth and the fact that you do have like a <laughs> lot of inventory, <laughs> you still have that in person yeah. relationship with people. You still have that experience where somebody comes in and they feel like they are, you know, it's like the che the cheers yeah. you know, trope, right? Like, hey, somebody actually knows who you are. They know you by name. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a big value. And like, I think again, I think that's one of the reasons why you've done so well. Like, you've got the, the yeah. ten year mark, which is yeah. a it's quite the milestone. Yeah, it's one of those ones where like building up that client experience is kind of how we got to where we are today. Um, and it's something where you like, you know, it, it, you know, it, for as much as people get excited about this field, it is retail. You know, and retail, you're only as good as your you know, uh, of the next sales day you got. So like, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's not really a field where you can say, well, you know, I coded some, I made some really good code and I'm going to like sit back on that and just like, let it run. <laughs> you know, it's like, nope. Yeah. You, you know, you did really good today. You got to get up tomorrow and do the same thing again. Like, it's just, you know, it's, it's a process and it's something that either you, you love that part of it or it just, you know, you hate it. And yeah, you know, I, I, I like that part of it. So yeah. And it I, works for me. And I like the way that you've positioned it in the sense that you do the thing that you like because you like it. Oh, yeah you get there's purpose and fulfillment alongside you know the actual like the, the just the business transactional money revenue life oh, oh, life totally. fulfillment when we, so when it's we all had, tied in together oh yeah when we had covid one of the things that we did was you know um that was a weird transition for us because we are very much an in-person experience mm -hmm. um and the challenge with covid was you know we were in nova scotia we were forced closed for a period of time um and <laughs> And that was one of the suckiest parts for me is that we were still open because we were doing some curbside delivery when that was possible and what have you. Um, but there was a day where I was like in there, I was like, you know, I was pulling lists for people and like realized that I missed the feedback of it and seeing people's names on orders who I'm like, I know this guy, you know, yeah. the, you know, I love talking with him when he comes in and now I've just got to like pull a list for him, hand him to a car window and not touch not him, touch him and like and not talk to him. And like, I, I, you know, it was something where I looked at my staff and like, cool, you guys can do this. I'm going home. Like, and when this is done, I will be back in, but like, I, I can't not have the social interaction part of it. I can't not talk to our clients because I, that's the part I really like, yeah. you know? So like pulling cards into a vacuum, just like, all right, well, I'll pull this list of 20 cards and I'll pull this next list. I just like, I will do that in store all day long and love it. I absolutely hate it. Like just pulling it to a list and not ever seeing the person It drives me nuts. Which I guess maybe that's uh, one of the reasons why you don't like the whole online aspect of things. Yeah. Besides the you know the market uh, online susceptibility, different. I guess. So I think the thing with online, the thing that's come back to it for me is that you know we don't do online sales. We do have an online store, um, mm. but our online store is for for pickup only. Pickup only. Delivery within. Yeah. Um, and so when we were, so one of the things that I found about cards is that cards are an ecosystem and that, you know, if you've got a local market for cards, so if you come to me and say, Hey man, you know, I'd really like to pick up this card. You know, I get paid in like two weeks and I go, yeah, cool. I can hold it aside for you. Or I can wait or I can keep an eye on it. Um, cause I know that you're going to come back and pick it up. It's that sort of client versus customer thing. Mm -hmm. Um, versus if I have an online store. I can't silo that card. So if someone you know, orders it from Vancouver or Texas, 
Um, they paid their money. We ship it out to them. You come back in two weeks and say, Hey man, I got paid. You know, I'd like that thing. I'm like, well, it's gone. Like, you know, somebody ordered online, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's vanished. That, that client will all of a sudden go, well, you know, that kind of sucks. I was like, I was excited for it. I, I, I planned for it, you know, and now it's not there. I guess I'll go online and order it because, you know, I can't get it from my local guy, which just starts a cycle of basically if you're taking those cards out of me, if I sell a card to somebody in Texas, you know, when they go to sell that card, when they're done with it, they're not selling it back to me. They're not shipping it back yeah. to me in Canada. They're not like doing an online trade. It's now in the Texas ecosystem. Yeah, it's in the, now in the Texas ecosystem it, or it goes to like some of the bigger players that are out there that you know, buy cards or would go to like a Grand Prix when those were a thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. The challenge is that, you know, if you are constantly taking cards from your local ecosystem and sending them out into the ether, you run out of the cards to support your local play. And when you do that, people come in, want to support you, want to shop with you, but you don't have what they're looking for. They go online and sort of self perpetuate. So we buy, if you trade into us, we buy everything, you know, like high end bulk, you know, we buy it all. Um, and my approach has always been that I don't know what my clients are going to want. So, I'm just going to try to have all of it. So if you come in, you know, why do I have, you know, 47 polluted deltas from cons? Because someone wanted to sell them to me and I don't know how many I'll need at some point. You know, there's definitely the argument of saying, well, anything past like the 13th or the 20th is probably something you're never going to sell. Yes, totally true. Um, but I want to keep those cards in a local ecosystem because if I don't and they wander off somewhere else, you know, and there's a run on it or it's something that gets super popular, mm. there's a chance that I'll never see those cards again. You know, if I sell them off to, you know, somewhere, you know, outside of our market, you know, they may just never wander their way back, you know, and it's something where, you know, to be able to support community, be able to support play, you need to have cards in your ecosystem for the decks that people want to play. And if you don't mm -hmm. have that, it becomes really hard to build that up. And once you sort of like start offloading it, it becomes a real challenge to kind of keep it healthy. So a lot of what I've seen, you know, for some stores that haven't made it, you know, is that yeah. if you're going to do online single sales, you need to be, I would argue you need to be willing to spend and buy in the way that some of the bigger players do. So things like star city or face or channel fireball back when they existed, um, you know, it's stuff where like you need to be buying and selling at bigger events. You need to be having automated buy lists. You need to treat it as a, strictly you know commercial transaction and do your buying accordingly if you're going to do the online space yep. to be effective at it because otherwise all you're going to do is you're going to take your cards from your local market ship them out somewhere else um, and if you're not replenishing that stock you're just going to run out of inventory in the long run so there's been stores that you know i've gone to where they've tried to do the online sales at a relatively smaller store and all they've succeeded in doing is sort of saying well i can't service the customers i have in person because I don't have the stock, so I need to sell the things I can sell to the online people, which means I just don't have the stock from an in-store person when he comes back in a couple of weeks. So it's a, you know, you just kind of grind yourself down. And then, you know, there's another asterisk of it is like, I hate shipping stuff. You know, it's something where like, I don't, yeah. I hate answering emails. Like, you know, if I have to have more than two or three email transactions or something, I'm just completely over it. <laughs> so it's something where, you know, like, you know, someone going, well, I want this thing and that thing, and this doesn't look, wasn't right, right, right. The benefit of in-person is that if you are someone who is like, the stuff we sell is in near mint condition by and large, some of it is slight play, anything less than that, we weed out in the buying process. Um, but if you're someone who's very particular about how your card looks, mm -hmm. um, the benefit of in-person versus online is that if I send you, you know, you know, if, if you come in person and say, you know, you pulled this card for me, it's not quite condition wise what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I have 12 others. You pick the one that's best for you. If none of them are, that's okay, man. Like, you know, you, you, you know, I didn't meet your expectations. You know, that's okay. Um, whereas if I ship that out to you, you know, all of a sudden now it's like, oh, well, it showed up. And like, now I got to ship it back. I got to ship don't it like back. It, if I don't like it. Or like, you know, maybe I, maybe I'm like willing to take it, but I'm not happy because I, I, you know, I wanted to pay. I paid near mint prices for something I think is not near mint, you know, and just going through that process is, you know, you know, you know, even if someone doesn't bring it up to you, it'll still be in their mind, right? It didn't meet expectations. Whereas if you're in person, we can fix that. You know, Hey, Hey, this didn't work. This wasn't what I thought it was. No worries, man. We'll swap it or refund it. No big deal. Like, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, you know, you know, or it's like, you know, Oh, the wrong card was pulled. Oh, no worries. Just like, you know, bring it back in. We'll switch her out. Sorry about that. Um, or things like, you know, something as simple as, oh my gosh, like the, the benefit of also that and when you keep it all in your local ecosystem is that you can also be, when it comes to condition, you can be a little more forgiving when it comes to trade-ins. 
So when it comes to mm -hmm. trade-ins, if you're dealing with someone like Ace or, you know, any of the bigger buyers like Card Kingdom, you know, the benefit, the, the downside of trading into someone there is that they need to care about condition because while we have the yeah. ability to sort of say, Hey man, in person, you didn't like it. Here's a different one. Swap you out. When somebody like Card Kingdom is buying stuff, they need to care if it's near mint, if it's slight play, if it's play, it's, gonna be very you know, specific. it's very specific, which means if you send off your cards to them, you know, there's a very good chance that they'll look at your card and go, this isn't all near mint, you know, and we, and they need to price it accordingly because, you know, they are not, they're selling near mint things at near mint prices, you know, and they're selling SP and SP prices and all that way through, which means they need to care. If you bring in me in a stack of stuff and I look and go, well, you know, that cons fetch has a little bit of a ding in the bottom of it. Nothing major. Like if you squinted, you see it, but it's not like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like a big splot just on the front of it. Yeah. You know, it's something where I can look at that and say, yeah, cool. That's good enough for what we're selling. Because if someone's particular about it, they just won't pick that one. You know, whereas, you know, if I'm selling digitally, I need to care. And all of a sudden I need to like needle you and be like, Hey man, I know I've got this card for 40 bucks, but this one's like slight play. So I'm going to sell it for like 30. So I'm going to give you 50. So 20, like it becomes a whole, you know, it feels bad on your client interaction side where they go, well, I bought these cards, you know, you know, and you know, yes, I bought them from you and yes, I played them, you know, but now you're telling me they are worth less than what I yeah. thought they would be, you know, you just don't want to get into that cycle, right? Because it makes someone feel like you're trying to get advantage or value out of them when in reality, what you're trying to do is sort of just be, you know, accurate for the next customer down the line, you know? So it's something mm -hmm. where it's like, if, you know, if something is in like, you know, a lesser condition than what you would expect it to be, you know, it's something where like, we will account for that. We'll basically say, okay, well, you know, this is close enough, you know, or if this one's so badly mangled that we need to like put in the separate category of like yeah. actual plate or damage, We'll let you know for that, but if it's like near mint to slight play, it kind of all flows in that range, um, which is something that you can't do when you're doing online sales because, yep. you know, you know, near mint versus SP will matter a lot in those experiences. Whereas with yep. us, we don't put that label on our stuff. My expectation is the stuff that we sell you will, you know, be near mint, occasionally SP. And if it's anything less than that, we missed it in the weeding out process and we'll get rid of it. So that's where the, the dollar bin ends up. But it's that sort of stuff where if you do the online, the benefit is that you have reach and access to all these people, but you have reach and access to a lot of customers and you have no access and you're to servicing your clients and the experience because you're not able to make those connections and make those sort of like, you know, those little minutia details of like, you know, all right, well, you know, this thing isn't quite what you wanted. We'll adjust it and fix it. You know, I can't do that on a customer digital basis because it's just not possible. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so selling online kind of forces you to take a different approach to selling in person as well. Yeah, it has. And then you also effects. have to balance it. Yeah, you know, you have to balance it with the input, right? Because yeah. you can't just open up the market and sell all your stuff and then have nothing to sell, right? Yeah. You need to be able to re replenish somehow. Yeah, you have to. It's so it's not as easy as just saying that we're going to have <coughs> an, on, an online store where we ship it to wherever, and we have an in-person store where we do something different. The challenge is that if you're going to do online, I think it needs to be a conscious choice with a plan of how you build out around it. So if you yeah. want to do online single sales, you need to acknowledge that you are forever going to be chasing the cheapest possible option. Cause that's what people are shopping for you for, you know, they may shop you for a selection. They may shop you for reliability that you're not going to mess up their order or shortchange them, yeah. but that's a pretty low bar for most tra transactions. Whereas, you know, when you get up to the, like the really big levels of it, you need to have the volume. You need to have the money to spend on it and you need to have the ability to sort of, you know, chug through it. And also as far as the store operations go, you need to have your inventory laid out in a way that's accessible and easy to fill online processing. So like, yeah, we could do a more wider open to like online sales in our current store, but that would mean that there would be someone constantly pulling cards like down in our basically point. like a warehouse yeah, operation. Yeah. Uh, and we would have to move it to a different location because all of a sudden you don't need front facing retail anymore for that. You just need, cheapest square footage possible and like pickers. And, yeah, and pickers and yeah. that's what you do right like that's a it's a totally viable model but it's definitely a very different model from your L, your lgs and mm -hmm. if you're doing that model you need to be aware of what it costs you to do like in terms of the yeah. experience it's interesting yeah. though i'm just i was curious as to like why that difference and i think you know that comes up in the conversation yeah. it's i'd say the the difference is that you know or why the lack of online is I think that online can be a really good business model. If you're looking to get a lot of client and a lot of customers, I think it is a model that if you're going to do it that way, 
you know, it's a disservice to your in-store experience clients. And we want to prioritize that, you yeah. know, and I think that part of it, the trade off for us is that the in-store experience is a more beneficial one. You know, we get a higher margin on in-store experience, you know, because mm -hmm. we're able to charge, you know, prices that make sense for what we're doing, you know, that are based on our local market conditions, um, you know, and it's something where it also makes it so that, you know, and the biggest sort of thing is like that example of, you know, guy saying, hey, I get paid in two weeks, can you hold it, you know, is a big part of our experience, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, not everyone has cash available all of the time. You know, not everyone who Especially is... Especially now. <laughs> yeah. Who's sort of like your regular loyal clients, like, you know, none of those, not everybody can sort of just drop, you know, 200 bucks on a win. Like a new Warhammer model comes out and go, well, you know, I'm going to have to plan for that. I got to save up for it. And if you're always prioritizing the person who has money somewhere out there, you know, that person who's your, your client, who's your, you know, who's your regular, you know, is going to feel like they don't matter because, you know, you just sold it to whoever had the money first. You know, and there's something to be said for, you know, having that, you know, sort of experience with someone goes, you know, so we've had a couple of, you know, there's one guy that I think of when I think of this stuff where it's, you know, he's gone through ups and downs in his life where he just like bought and sold out of magic kind of repeatedly, you know, and it's stuff where, you know, when he's come back in, we've always figured out how to get him his stuff back together. You know, like we've always sort of like, you know, you know or we said, hey, man, like, you know this this part of what you're selling you know is only going to be like 20 bucks in trade but we'll serve as the core of your deck when you come back in for it you know so like it's something like you know if you're always just selling online you sort of lose that ability to cater to those client experiences and really sort of you know have someone come back and want to stick with you but uh, no it's i think that the online is a really it's a really powerful option but i think if you're going to do it I think that it doesn't make sense to have a front facing op like this outside of just having someone at a desk where they come and pick up their stuff and they kind of go. So like if you've, you know, I'm sure you've been to the face to face locations, mm -hmm. um, a lot of their locations kind of feel that way is that they are, you know, they have some set dressing for sort of like, you know, you know, some, some nice staff and some stuff on the table, but like they're really there to fill their warehouse operation, which is their whole business model, right? You know, they want to, yeah. they want to have you come and pick up your order in and out. If you've got trades, you know, come in or book an appointment and it'll get you in and gone. But like their, their main function is that they, you know, they are here to warehouse pull lists for you, you know, and they will get them to you in a timely and efficient manner. It's like, you know, it's like, it's very much a, this it's a different of, value proposition. Yeah. It's the, it's sort of like they're, they're taking the approach and to use a restaurant analogy of, you know, they're, they're doing the McDonald's thing. They're giving you what you asked for, yeah. you know, and it is going to be efficient. It's going to be exactly what you expect it to be because mm -hmm. that's just, their model and that model is really good, you know, but it's not going to give you that sort of intimacy of like, you know, I went to a nice restaurant, you know, I had a great experience, you know, like the server talked to me, you yeah. know, like I, I, I felt like a, I felt like I had an experience versus just getting a hamburger. Like it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's the difference of, you know, that sort of in-store experience versus the online. And I think that they are very sharp contrast because they require different things from your back end. So if you're going to do that yep. in-store experience, you know, you need to have time to chat. You need to have time to like, you know, you know, go back and forth. Whereas if you have the, you know, if you have the, the, the McDonald's model, you know, you just need to be operationally efficient. You know, it, yeah. it works a certain way because that's the only way you can handle that kind of volume. Cause like, you know, why I said, you know, we have a hundred transactions a day face has thousands, thousands, right. You know, and there's no way to sort of do that sort of like, Oh, well, you know, buddy wants this held for him for two weeks because he's like, not at that scale. Like, not at that scale. You can't do that. You, you can't make those car routes and exceptions. So yeah. it's part of like the online versus in store. I think they are, you know, I think you can definitely merge them. I think if you're a smaller operation, you can definitely make that work. And some bigger operations make it work well too. But I think that they are not as compatible as they would need to be for us to want to incorporate them. But again, we, we prioritize really heavily the, the in-store experience. So that clouds my judgment on what I think is, you know, sure. And it depends yeah. what you want to do with like, as the owner, it depends what you want to do with your business, right? Mm -hmm. It's what do you want your life to be like day to day? Yeah. And for some, it's <laughs> my like, not I, answering emails. <laughs> yeah. And for you, it's like, you want to be here. You want to have those conversations. That's oh, yeah. what makes you happy. That's the part that fulfills you by being the owner. But yeah. for others, it might be like, well, you know, I like that. I like having the store and I like being able to enjoy my hobbies or, yeah. you know, and share the passions that got me into this business in the first place. But I also want to spend time doing other things as well. So yeah. not being the face or not having those conversations might not be as high of a priority. Oh, yeah. And for them, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Like set up all those systems to sell online. Like if you want to compete with face or you want to 
do something along those lines, and that's the goal. Oh, I have no, I have no, actually, I have no ambition for any of that. <laughs> I look at them go like that. Some days I look at this, man, this has got like really big, <laughs> and it's like I'm like I'm not sure if it's like got too big for me yet, but we'll see. But it's something where like the, you know, we've had a couple of approaches for different things like that, and the answer has been like you know, you know, on a practical level, I I don't want a whole lot. You know, I want to like you know be able to do the kind of things I'm interested in. I like to be able to spend time with you know my partner, and I. That's about it. I'm not like super, you know, commercially driven. Like, you know, if, if we make, you know, more money versus less this year, cool. Eh, you know, it's, it's, it's something where like, you know, we'll do what we did this year, which is like all of our staff got bonuses this year and raises. So like, sure. Like, you know, I, you know, I'm not looking to, you know, as much as I have hoarded stuff, I'm not looking to be a drag. <laughs> <laughs> I love the free market capitalism business, all that stuff is a thing I'm, I'm very happy about. I like that a lot, but there's definitely like some downsides to the, you know, uh, I got to grow and have profit all the time, every time. And it's always got to get bigger. And like, I think that, that leads to some problems. Yeah, and I, I think, think having the satisfaction that you're saying like, okay, we got to this point. I'm happy. Employees are happy. I can pay my people. Clients are happy. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Nothing. nothing. And I think that the, the challenge sometimes with that is that, you know, it's a, you know, it's always easy to sort of like want to push for more. You want to say that if I have more, I will be happy. Um, yeah. And there's definitely a level at which like people need more to be to meet their their needs. Um, but at a certain level, you have to look and go, well, you know, like I don't need a BMW. You know, I drive yeah. like I drive like a shitty ten year old Yaris, and uh, I'll <laughs> drive until it dies. Like you know, you know, because it's not something that's important to me. You know, but what is important is you know making sure that you know my staff are able to be able to live a life to do what they want to do that they have a life outside of this, that it's not that they're coming to work every day and they're feeling like they're not getting by. You know, it's something where, you know, I don't see it as a, you know, I don't see it as a, I need to acquire more stuff. I see it as, you know, a, you know, what can I do with the resources that I've been able to get, you know, like, and if that means I can make other people's lives better, I'll do that. Cause that's, you know, you know, I'm not really a stuff motivated person, you know, contrary to what our branding says. Yeah. <laughs> I do like things, but like, it's, it's not a defining feature. <laughs> well, those things facilitate the yeah. in-person experience. Oh, exactly. That's that. the connection point. That's, yeah. the, that's the thing that you really like. Yeah. I, I like being able to meet people's demands and sort of like, you know, get them what they're looking for. And the, the having the things leads to that part of it. So, you know, people ask me what I'm going to do with all my stuff. It's like, the answer is, I don't know, but maybe someone wants it someday. And it'll be organized and you know accessible. And if they want it, it's here for them. And if they if no one ever needs it, that's okay too. So what's coming for 2024? Oh, 2024. So 2024 will be our 10 year anniversary in August of the deck box specifically. Um, and the plan this year is we are returning to like our full slate of events. So we've got uh, we did prior to COVID something called uh, the deck box masters, which is basically a a uh, monthly event where we do sort of like a small buy-in. So it's 10 bucks, but with a big guaranteed prize, you pool, use like $300 and like credit kind of cut a different, cut a couple different ways that scales up based on attendance. So basically the more people we get, we hit like enough 20, we do another prize tier bump up, we hit 30, another prize tier bump up. Um, and that's something where we haven't done that in a while. Um, and I'm excited to go back to it, but we've also booked out our command fest stuff, which would be super fun. Uh, a bunch of like Warhammer events, um, but yeah, basically this year will be a year of, you know, we've been doing this for almost a decade you know, here. And what we're looking to do this year is just to sort of like finalize all the learnings that I've done over the last like 10 years, which is, you know, you know, I've, you know, in the process of, you know, talking with our clients and sort of trying different things, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that are sort of, you know, that are kind of like, you know, best practices for us that we could be doing a little better. And it's more of this year is going to be about, you know, being the best or we can be sort of setting it to a level of expectation of, you know, this is how we'll operate and just going forward from there. So a lot of like what we're doing is a mix of more events and more promotion of the things we're doing and more outreach. So more things where we're going to sort of spotlight our community. So we're doing this expansion, but and part mm -hmm. of it is to sort of be able to do more content creation stuff where we can feature folks from our community who are excited to play games and sort of show people that, you know, this is a lot of fun and, you know, wherever you play, you know, however you engage with it, you know, this is something where, you know, you should be included and feel that you know, this is a fun thing that you want to do. Um, so we're doing it in my, my marketing person absolutely hates me for this. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, the plan is that we're doing our content creation stuff on YouTube and Instagram and all that. 
and the point of it is just to turn, you know, as the point of it, none of it's going to be monetized <laughs> in case when I say this. Um, but the point, the one of the main reasons we want to is that, you know, we're in a fortunate position of our day to day operations pays for something like this, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the benefit of, you know, being able to make our own content that's not dependent on, you know, having to push a narrative or having to sort of like talk about, you know, things that make someone angry so they click on it, yeah. you know, is something where like, you know, I'm a very positive person when it comes to a lot of these games because, like, you know, you'll see a lot of content online that goes, most broken deck thing ever you've ever seen. You know, this is like something destroying the game. You know, when's it all going to end in a dumpster fire? Um, I've been around for this for 20 plus years, you know, and people have been saying that for a very long time. And I have yet to see that occur. <laughs> you know, everyone always predicts the apocalypse, but, you know, yeah. hasn't shown How many times has magic died? <laughs> a lot. A lot. You know, a lot. <laughs> um, but I would say that the, the benefit of doing your own stuff is they know we're just going to be the same people that you see in store, same sort of thing online. You know, like, you know, if I'm telling you about something, it's because I'm excited about it. If I'm not excited about it, you know, I'm probably going to skip it. You know, and if it's something where, you know, we can do something fun and cool and creative, we'll do that. You know, and if it's something where we can't, we'll just leave it. Cool. Got anything planned for your anniversary? Oh, I'm supposed to. But I haven't you figured it out yet. Of all the things you could do, like the 10 year anniversary is like, a, that's a thing to it's celebrate, a big right? One. I think we have a Command Fest planned for that weekend, uh, which is kind of one of our really fun programs we've done. And if, um, and if there are actually, if there's a store owner watching it that hasn't seen it, I'd say of all the things to look at, uh, Command Fest is one of our most popular things we've done in the last couple of years. <laughs> um, but yeah, as far as like Command Fest is, for those of you who haven't seen it before, it's basically a event where we do four rounds of play. Uh, each round is like an hour and 20 minutes long. Um, and everyone who shows up gets a swag bag with a bunch of stuff in it. Um, and one of the things is a bingo sheet. And basically, as you fill out the bingo sheet, uh, you win prizes. Um, and all the bingo sheet stuff is kind of based around in-game mechanics where you're not actively trying to win. So it's things like, you know, save an opponent from dying, do something super like complicated. And it's very much designed to sort of let like you play as like a, you know, it's a casual competitive play experience where the goal is to check off the things that you can and help the other guys out while you're doing it. So it's something where we do that. We do, we did, we started that in 2022, we did our first one. And um, we did two last year. And I think the plan is to do another two this year. And historic, and we got 130 players at the last one. So it's it's a really great way to build community and really great way to do an event with you know kind of like stakes and prizes, but keep it super casual so people kind of engage on their own levels and don't have to sort of like feel like that they got to build like the most tuned competitive deck they possibly can. It resonates perfectly with the commander. Oh ethos, yeah. right. Like it's for most fun. part, commander players are not looking to, not generally looking to like I want to win the game immediately. It's more of like, well, let's just have a good time. Yeah, let's and, let's and do some stuff. Do some weird, like, weird things. So we have one of the achievements is, um, you know, attack with all of your creatures into an opponent that's not tapped out, you know, and just mm. yell Leroy. Let's do this. Leroy Dragons! Oh my god, he just ran in. <laughs> so it's like, that's one of the check marks, and it's like, you know, so you just got to hear that every so often when we're during the command fest. But no, so it's a lot I haven't heard that meme in a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how you know I'm old. <laughs> but no, yeah, it's been something where this year is a year of just kind of, you know, going a bit back to basics of, you know, and and kind of like building more into our event scene again now that we're well and truly kind of able to do that. And no, it's been good. Cool. Almost at the two hour mark. So this yeah. has been great. But sure. I want to ask, sure, is one of like the closing questions is uh, going into 2024. What do you think is the most important thing for store owners to be thinking about right now? I'd say in 2024, the biggest thing that I would say is that when it comes to how you run your store is you really need to know what will make you profitable and successful in terms of dollars and cents. So all of the things I talk about, all the things about community and all the things about how you build up clients is very true and it's very heartfelt. The, the underlying of all that, though, as I talked earlier about that, you know, you need to have the community building and you need to have the retail. You know, so if you're if your retail proposition is not set up to actually be successful for you, you know, if you're not able to sort of like, you know, demand, get the margin that you need to kind of make all these things possible. Cause you know, command fest is super fun. It costs us thousands of dollars to run a command fest. Cause we book out the hotel, we give away a lot of prizes and it's something that that's only possible to do that kind of a spend because we've been that profitable through the run of the year to justify it. So we charge an entry fee for command fest. It doesn't cost cover the per person headcount for it. But it's something where like that's a way we give back to our community because we've been profitable year round. So like 
you know, one of the biggest things that people feel incentivized to do as a retailer is to cut prices and sort of like operate on a lesser margin. Mm -hmm. And every time you do that, you make it harder for yourself to succeed. And I, and having run a store in a small environment, I get that pressure. You know, I get that pressure to want to be price competitive with online, with like wanting to be competitive with the guy down the street, you know, but the reality of it is it's, it's the basic math part of it, right? If I'm selling a box for 180 bucks and the guy down the street is selling it for 120 bucks, you know, he's going to sell more boxes than I am, but I am, I need to sell that box at the margin that makes sense because otherwise I can't justify the other stuff. So like, you know, it also means that your ordering is a lot easier because you're not, if you're the guy who's selling boxes for 120 bucks, you're going to sell through like a hundred boxes, but like, you've got to take the hit on that if it doesn't sell. So if it comes yeah. in, the set is bad or you just misjudge the market, you have very little wiggle room to correct from that. Whereas if you're like, well, I'm going to bring in a modest amount of boxes. I'm going to sell through them, whether it's packs or as sealed boxes, because someone likes me, and wants to support me, or maybe they got trade credit with me. So it's cheaper and they want to buy it there for whatever reason. That margin is a healthy margin that allows you to survive. Whereas another, you know, cutting prices to a minimal margin is we are a niche business, you know, you know, niche businesses really don't survive on margins that are as low as some people would like to put them to. Um, and if the people who are telling you your margin needs to be this, because I want to be able to buy a box for 120 bucks, you know, that's getting back to that range of might be a client, probably a customer, yeah. you know, which is something where, you know, that little difference, and that's sort of being able to stick to your price point and know what you need to do. So it's kind of like, make that number make sense for you, you know, is really important because otherwise, you know, you know, for if someone's, so if, if a box is 110 bucks and he's selling it for 120, he's making 10 bucks on that box, which means he needs to sell seven boxes, eight boxes to sort of, you know, make the amount of profit that you sell on a box. It's more effort and more work, you know, for maybe the same amount of money, if not less. So you need yeah. to start, you know, you, you need to acknowledge that you are a niche business no one needs my product. Like no one, no one needs magic cards. No one needs Warhammer. They really like these things and enjoy them. But in terms of like a, you have to need to buy like, you know, necessities, you know, this is the thing that gets cut, you know? Yeah. So, you know, cutting yourself to the bone on the margin makes sense when you're dealing with necessities. Cause you know, everyone's needs milk. Everyone needs, you know, you know, the yeah, basics of life. yeah, everyone needs the basics of life. You need to be competitive on there with a niche mark product. You know, if someone's, you know, not willing to buy at a price point that makes sense for your business model, you know, your business model doesn't work at that point. Cause like if, if you're, if you're saying, well, I need to compete with, you know, face or I need to compete with, you know, whoever for like the cheapest Amazon for the cheapest possible box, you can't compete with that level of scale. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. You know, the, the, even if you could compete on the price point, they have such a bigger selling apparatus than a bigger reach that someone's not going to know about you. You know, so if you're going to say, okay, well, you know, I'm as cheap as Amazon, but Amazon's going to get way more sales because Amazon can directly market to all of its existing customers. You know, whereas you've only got you know whoever kind of comes to your store or is in your ecosystem, and if they're already doing that, they're probably not necessarily a super big Amazon customer to begin with. So I'd say biggest thing I could say is you know all of the things that you see those you know for store owners, all the things that you see that is built is built on the basis of you know client appreciation and understanding and growing our community but also have a, having a firm grasp of, you know, what a, kind of a margin I need to make to be able to make that happen. So, you know, you know, yes, we could run sales. Yes, we could run discounts. Yes, we could do all these things to generate more sales and be more price competitive, but that doesn't work with our approach as being, you know, a, a higher end niche experience, you know, and either someone appreciates that or they don't. And, you know, our model has proven that people do appreciate that. I think it's a great, uh, a great closing optimistic thought. I, like, I try. <laughs> I, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I like the advocating for people to charge what they're worth. It's hard, right? It's, oh, uh, it's definitely Because there's so much pressure from customers. Customers oh, there's pressure who from want clients, most the, of the maximum thing. value out of you as much as they can get. Oh, totally. And it's and again, I, I don't take it as an adversarial thing. It's, you know, if someone, you know, if someone wants the best possible deal, I that's totally okay. Like, I have no judgment about that. You know, if someone wants to price shop, all I'm saying is that, you know, for this model to work, how we built it, you know, this is, you're right. This is what it's worth to me. And if it's not worth that to you, that's okay. 
you know, you know, it's something where you're like, you know, we're not a fit and it's kind of like dating. If it doesn't work out, if we're incompatible, okay. I'd rather know that from the beginning and just go, yeah, you're a really cool person, you know, and, you know, but we just, we just don't click in that way. That's okay. Like, you know, there, there's other people out there. There's a couple billion people around you. Like you will find someone who clicks for you. Um, and that's how we've kind of built our stuff. So it's something where the, it, there's a lot of pressure to want to like do the price point thing, but you know, price is not a competitive advantage. Price is a, a thing that anyone who's willing to can go down to it. So if we wanted to create our box sales for our local market, we could go down to doing 120 bucks a box. Like, yeah. you know, I could lose, you know, I could sell it under cost for 10 bucks a box all day long and probably not care, but like, that's not a healthy way to treat your market. It's not a healthy way to treat your hobby, you know, and it's something where, you know, just cause you can do it doesn't mean that you should. And I, I think the idea of, of thinking about the experience that you offer, not necessarily as good or bad or better or worse than other experiences. Yeah. Just different. Yeah. Right. You're the steakhouse. Yeah. That not everyone's going to want to go come to a steakhouse. Oh yeah. We, we Sometimes have, we, people want to go to McDonald's and that's okay. We have, we have people who've come in and told us like point blank. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you're a little too fancy for me. I don't feel comfortable. It's like, you know, I would always like, <laughs> some, I would always want someone to feel comfortable with us, but I totally get that some people want that traditional, you know, old style game store model. Um, I get it. Like, that's what I grew up in. Like, you know, places that were like a little, little dusty, little dingy, like little, yeah. like you, you wouldn't really want your mom to stick around after they you know, dropped you off. Like, you know, I, I get it, you know, but you know, <laughs> we're not that. And I understand that, you know, as, as, as a preference choice. Right. And it's something where, you know, not everyone will see the value in what we offer and that's okay. You know, there, there, there is, you know, other places, other stores that, you know, will, will be a better home for them that they'll, they'll feel more comfortable at. And I encourage people to do that sort of stuff. Absolutely. All right. Do you have any closing thoughts for anyone who's listening right now? Anything you want to say to them? Uh, -huh. I'd say the biggest takeaway is if you took nothing from this is that community is a really big part of what we do. The community is, it's how we got to where we are. You know, you know, it is, it's all well and good to say that we have all of these cool things and all of the stuff and all these like neat accomplishments we've done. None of that happens without our clients and none of it happens without the communities that we built along. Um, you know, and I'm always just very appreciative of just having the chance to have done that. You know, it's something where, you know, I get to live a life where I'm surrounded by things that I really enjoy. Uh, and I get to help other people find the joy and the things that they're excited about. And that's something where, you know, you know, a lot of people come to these sort of hobbies as a way to escape from the things that are going on in their life. And mm -hmm. some of it's just that they enjoy doing it and it adds value and you know, nuance to it. And it's something where that's something I'm really happy to be involved in. You know, it's something where, you know, we are a retail store with a events operation. Um, but it's something where you know, people are here to have a good time and we will do what it takes to sort of, you know, make sure that happens. And I'm just, Glad to be able to do it.